strengthened with proper accountability and disclosure to the public. LB 718 as amended by AM 1553 was drafted not as a reaction to a well-publicized isolated incident that happened on the University of Nebraska last August, as some would have you believe. Yes, it certainly was a catalyst to research this issue more closely. The more my staff and I researched what was happening on college campuses across the nation, as well as the personal letters and emails we received, it became abundantly clear and that something needed to be done. I'm not alone in my conclusions. Seven states have already passed similar legislation. Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Utah, all with broad bipartisan support. Ten states, including California and Illinois, have legislation pending. The LB 718 was modeled after other state legislation and the work of the Goldwater Institute. The LB 718 directs the governing boards of the University of Nebraska, Nebraska State Colleges, and Community Colleges to adopt a set of policies governing free speech on its campuses. It also requires that each governing board create a committee of free expression. This committee will provide an annual report to the public, its own governing board, the governor, and the legislature. This report shall include any barriers to or, incident, or incidents of disruption of free expression on campus and what disciplinary action, if any, was taken against members of the campus community. The campus community composing of students, faculty, and invited guests an amended version of LB 17 will grant the governing body's broad discretion to develop policies for free speech. And we'll speak further to that future amendment that we'll be discussing later. After months of the University of Nebraska being in the spotlight on how they handle the well-publicized free speech issue, I was encouraged to see that the Board of Regents finally researched, wrote, and approved just last week, last Thursday, a new policy titled Commitment to Free Expression, Guide for Facility Use and Education. As a result of this new policy, many have recommended that we declare victory and withdraw the bill. The major issue I have with their new policy is that it does not include a reporting component to the public, which would hold them accountable for their actions or inaction. Additionally, LB 718 is not limited to just the University of Nebraska system, but to all institutions of higher learning within the state. Institutional administrators come and go, board members come and go, and yes, legislators come and go. But a sound and just law stands the test of time. We need to restore the public trust that the rights of students, faculty, and guests have to free expression will be protected within institutions of higher learning. Following my opening, uh, members of FIRE, Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, will be testifying in regard to the constitutional <coughs> issues raised by the uh, NU Board of Regents versus Exxon. I would be very glad to answer any questions to the best of my ability. Thank you, Senator Holleran. I think I'll hand it over to Chairman Groney. Thank you. Is this the closing already? Did I miss it all? <laughs> this is closing. That concludes the hearing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, committee. <laughs> Thank you. Did you bring the amendment, Mr. <coughs> Thanks for. Uh, the amendment will be discussed. I mean, this was this was done uh, just uh, as as we uh, how would you say on the fly in my office okay. uh, this afternoon. So you don't have the amendment. So right now, no, okay. but that will be passed around when Fire gives its presentation. Okay. okay? Any questions, Senator Erdman? Senator Gordon, thank you. So, you, briefly, if, if you're going to talk about the amendment, can you describe what your amendment does? What does it, what does it change? And how <coughs> just briefly, what does it change on the bill? Uh, I, I would rather leave that up okay. to them, but it will, it will, uh, it will uh, focus mostly on the very specific recommendations that we made for their policy on free speech. Yeah, that'd be great. And, and, it, and it will address, it will address the issue of us. Um, requiring them to do something and eliminate that any form of requirement to their discretion on how they do it. 
which is based on the basics of, uh, of, of, of uh, yeah. border regions versus Exxon. So I can conclude from your comments that because of what you've seen them adopt last <coughs> year, you've then adjusted your bill accordingly. Is that would that be fair to say that? Uh, that would be fair to say that. Yeah. Okay. So you notice they commented about uh, the constitutionality of what you're trying to do, and I, I believe Senator Moorfield, you, you've had a similar situation about talking about your bill being not constitutional. It's not con unconstitutional. The judge says it's not unconstitutional. So. We do that all the time here. We pass things that aren't constitutional according to some people. <laughs> Back in, Ten years ago they passed they moved the state fair to Grand Island. That was deemed unconstitutional too. And the state fair is in Grand Island. So mm -hmm. I've said. Very good. Thank you, sir. Senator Penzenbrook. Well, I'd just like to add for the record that just because it hasn't been ruled unconstitutional by a court doesn't mean that we can't see on their face that a law, I'm not speaking specifically about this, but we can determine through study and education and uh, legal advise, advisors whether or not something is or is not constitutional. So I hope that our general goal is not to wait until the Supreme Court rules it unconstitutional. I agree. Okay. And Fire will uh, speak more eloquently on this issue than I will. So. Thank you. Unless you have something I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Flowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator, I, I just wanted to double check and make sure we still have a Board of Regents with the University up through last weekend. Is that correct? They're, they're still in place? Is this a serious question? Yes, yes sir. They, yes, sir. There is a Board of Regents. Okay. And are, is this in conflict with what you see them doing as far as what you're trying to put forward here? Well, until last Thursday, I had nothing to go by as far as their policy on free speech. I'm, so, I'm talking about last Thursday. So this, this, this drafting of this bill took place over the last several months, and we did the best that we could looking at commonly held precepts on the First Amendment, and we put them in the bill, lacking really anything else to go by from, uh, from the Board of Regents or the administration on their free speech policy. So. As we listen to fire that's following me, we'll be discussing how we can deal with not abridging the uh, the uh, Exxon versus the Board of Regents, mm -hmm. and uh, and and have have a bill that will future be amended that will be, I think, amicable to them, and also will help rebuild the trust with the public. So the university does have a free free speech article. For interpretation and something that they can pass on to the students and that does exist, is that correct? They would be better to address that. But as of last Thursday was when they announced this uh, most recent policy. It didn't exist before? They would be better to address that than I would. You have no opinion on it? Well, I, it wouldn't be good for an opinion on something I'm not sure about, but the fact of the matter is, Whatever they had before, they they uh, felt it was necessary to edit and update it. Thank you. You're welcome, Senator Halloran. Have you have any correspondence with anybody at the university about the content of your bill? Not direct correspondence. Uh, it was no secret. Shortly after the incident in August, uh, it was probably mid-September, late September, that uh, uh, my office made it clear that we were looking at formulating or drafting a bill uh, <coughs> regarding free speech on campus. And uh, at several interviews on the radio, I made it clear that I was more than willing to work with them on the bill. Uh, we had not been in communication, and up until November 16th, uh, with a meeting with um, President Bounds and Chancellor Green, uh, and Senator Erdman and Senator um, Baker, or <coughs> Brewer, he's not going to forgive me for that, uh, and myself, um, at that meeting, uh, I too, at that very same time, or at that time I offered as well, uh, invited them to participate with me to, to uh, draft this language, and I never heard back from them. So maybe we'll hear today what specifically in this legislation they disagree with. I don't know. Maybe the access to campus for purposes of free speech, I doubt they'd disagree with that. Or public areas of campus are traditional public forums, I don't think they would disagree with that. So I would hope we hear from them what specifically 
passing this legislation they think uh, tramples on like free speech rights. So thank you. That, that they haven't talked to you at all about any specific. N not specifically. No. Thank you. Any other questions, Senator Halloran? Proponents? Uh, any proponents? <coughs> How many proponents do we have? We'll come to the front of the room so we can. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Joe Cohn. I'm the Legislative and Policy Director at the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education, or as we're better known, FIRE. Uh, we're a national nonpartisan organization that deals exclusively with university student and faculty rights. Could you spell your name? C-O-H-N and Joe, J-O-E. Uh, we have, over the course of our uh, almost 20 years of existence, uh, defended students on every part of the political spectrum, on every side of every controversial issue, on their rights to engage in the marketplace of ideas and, uh, and, and speak their minds. Um, and we're here today to support SB7, sorry, uh, LB718. Uh, uh, but we are suggesting a, uh, an amended version uh, to deal with uh, some of the unique uh, constitutional requirements here in the state, in particular uh, Regents versus Exxon. The main holding of, that ca uh, of, of the case is a paragraph that says, in prescribing the powers and duties of the Regents, a legislative act must not be so detailed and specific in nature as to eliminate all discretion and authority on the part of the Regents as to how a duty shall be performed. Okay, and that's you know designed you know wisely to try to keep politics out of the day-to-day -day operations of, of institutions. That being said, I doubt your state legislature intended to uh, ever make sure, uh, make it so that only the regents could enforce building codes on your campuses. They apply more broadly because it's important that they are consistent. Same with anti-discrimination policies. You don't exempt them from your state anti-discrimination laws and say that only they may pr pr make produce a, a policy. Uh, and the same should be true of other just broad constitutional uh, requirements, so long as you're not getting into the specific detail, it must be this policy, copy and paste, so long as you're giving appropriate uh, discretion. And it's on that front that we took a look at the bill and I've distributed uh, for you a proposed amendment that essentially says that they should adopt a policy, and I'm going to paraphrase, um, that should promote free speech on campus without infringing on the rights of students, faculty, and their invited guests to engage in expressive activities that have been found to be protected under the First Amendment or under your Nebraska uh, Constitution. And that the policy should ensure that faculty and invited guests who wish to engage in at least non-commercial expressive activity should be permitted to do so freely so long as their conduct does not unlawfully uh, materially and substantially disrupt the functioning of institutions. Um, none of that gets into the problem areas of Exxon where it's really getting into the micromanage. They're going to be the ones creating a policy. It just needs to be one that is favorable to free speech you know, as, as broadly defined. And then the last operative uh, kind of paragraph here is the governing body should have the broad discretion in adopting a policy consistent with the act so long as any time, place, and manner restrictions that they create comply with what the case law says. And that's the standard that's repeated here. So they're going to be the ones deciding what their time, place, and manner restrictions will look like, whether or not they want to have restrictions on using volume outside of the library or using, you know, or having crowds outside of their dorms at night. They're going to make all of those detailed descriptions, just as the case requires, uh, for the regents to use and exercise their discretion in figuring out how to execute this concept of protecting free speech on campus. We think this bill is important uh, to do as a legislature because policies can change uh, and we don't want the forward progress that's been made last week to disappear when your watchful eye isn't on it any further. So I thank uh, your time, you for giving me this time and look forward to answering your questions.
questions? Senator Fanzing Brooks. Do you think your amendments are specifically missing from what the Board of Regents intends to do and why is this necessary? Yeah, the Board of Regents uh, recent adoption is a pretty broad, you know, policy statement on, you know, that adopts roughly the, the Chicago principles, the University of Chicago adopted on uh, campus free speech. But they don't get into some of the nitty gritty stuff like getting rid of once and for all free speech zones. So that's, so that's one of the things that we look at at FIRE is that we see campuses all the time make broad flowery language about promoting free speech. We ask them to do that. We think it's a step in the right direction. But then they need to look at their actual policies further and see if they're actually upholding those standards. Do your computer use policies really meet what the case law says uh, mm -hmm. on, on free speech. Do your <coughs> distribution policies and, and, and you know, actually meet any of those standards? And the answer right now at UNL is still no. And even after the adoption of the policies on Thursday. So they should be commended for taking an important step in the right direction. That's for sure, and I don't want that to be uh, interpreted uh, lightly. I think they've definitely taken an important step in the right direction, but they haven't solved their problem on free speech. I mean, you still have a faculty member, even though it's controversial on this board, uh, a graduate student who isn't allowed to teach based on an incident uh, that happened of an exchange of people arguing, the incident that people have referred to before. That's still the status quo today, with or without the Thursday policy revision. So my answer is no, they haven't turned the corner to now be a bastion of free speech that the rest of the country should look at as the model. They could use your help. They could use all of your but help to get there. You're saying that that, um, that what they've adopted is quite broad, but it's not specifically broad enough. We, well, so we see in, in statements, you know, a, a university say, we will respect free speech because free speech is really important. No, it's really, really, really important. But then when you get into the specifics of each one of the policies on narrow areas of how they regulate things, they don't meet up to those standards. So what I'm saying is UNL adopted a policy that commits itself, a policy statement, that we will really, really, really care about free speech on campus. Well, that's really good. That's an important step. But now they need to, to do that. They need to back that by looking at their written policies as they are, comparing it to the standard that they expressed was the policy that they care about, and reforming those <clears throat> operational policies as necessary. That hard work hasn't happened yet. So, 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 so definitely an important step in the right direction to recommit you know, a, as a policy statement that these things matter. They should be commended on that without any reservations. I'm not trying to, to be hesitant in, in, in my support for what they've done, but they have more work to do. So I, I, I don't know enough about the, the, all the particulars of the situation, but it's my understanding that there was one student who was exercising her free speech against another student who was exercising her free speech. One, one, ele, one of those uh, persons has a higher priority of speech. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? No. I mean, we, we disagreed with some folks that we're working on on this bill on how that individual case unfolded. I, I don't want to mince words on, on that. But the policies you set as a committee are going to be used to always deal with how these things should work, like black letter law. And our view is that both students were engaged in free speech. That's why I said, if you want to ask me if UNL's done the right thing, we're still in a situation where one of those students has been punished for speech that they've engaged in. And there's no you know, sign that that's going to be lifted. So if you're asking me if UNL is in the clear and should be held out as an example of an institution that truly respects free speech because of their vote last week, my answer is no. You still have a student who's not allowed to get back into the classroom as a result of a heated exchange. So arguably because of legislative pressure. I'm going to stay out of 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 well, of arguing. We have to but, we have to work in the realm of, of the facts we know and the policies we're trying to create. Right, but the, connected to the policies and the facts that have occurred to bring this forward. I, I, I agree, but at the end of the day, what you put in the statute 
is going to be what's written down on the paper. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that it gets it right, regardless of, you know, I can work with someone and agree with them on 80% of things and disagree with them on 20%, and I'm not going to view, and I'm happy to still work with them in all of the areas of agreement. And that's really where I'm at here, is that I disagreed with some folks who are supportive of this bill and how they interpreted that particular situation, but there's no doubt in my mind that they care about advancing free speech generally, and I want to help them get it right. And I hope that all of this committee, you know, looks at the letters of what's in the writing and make sure that at the end of the day they pass things only if it gets it right. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. For, you. for clarification, in defense of the university, the student, both students are still in school. One is a graduate student, mm -hmm. one is a uh, underclass student. They fired the individual as an intern, as a classroom lecturer, not tenured, for decorum and behavior towards a student. They didn't kick the, the student out of school. Is that true? No, that, that, is, that is true. They did it as an employer. Doesn't but free speech stop with your employment? You can say what you want, but your employer can dismiss you for that behavior? No, not in, not, not, not in all circumstances, and certainly not in the educational setting where you also have academic freedom There's different concerns. free speech standards for educational employees versus a bank teller? Yeah, there are, um, and 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 there are there are. I mean, uh, <laughs> there are. There's there's a, there's a, there's extensive case law on on and on how there's a need for academic freedom, you know, in, in settings that you don't really have robust exchange of ideas, uh, without faculty members being even freer. So whereas. You know, an institution taking an action against a regular staff person who doesn't have classroom responsibilities, um, you know, that's, that, that's different because you don't have the, the academic freedom concerns that are a necessary ingredient for a university to thrive. And that's because on if the they campus or in the classroom? In, in all settings? It's, it's different depending on where in which settings, but um, it, it, you know, I'll get really to the nitty gritty because I know you have a lot of people here uh, for time. Inside the classroom, uh, there's even broader protection so long as you're remotely germane to the subject matter of the class, broadly construed, and not using up a tremendous amount of the classroom time. So even if you go off topic, if it's brief, you know, you're not supposed to take actions. We're not trying to create teachers that are Autobots. Um, but uh, outside of the classroom, there's so much to the vitality of higher education that doesn't only limit itself to the classroom, where you want thinkers to be able to express themselves. So, you know, if you're concerned about the national trend of fewer and fewer conservative faculty members, and fewer and fewer people of conservative voices being able to speak their minds, then you need to provide really robust protections for people to speak their minds across the board. And, you know, don't fall in love with the club that's going to be used to beat you over the head. You know, to be, you know because, because, that, because that's, that, that at the end of the day is the, is, the, is the concern, is that, you know, any time a conservative faculty member says something that isn't, you know, in line with the, with, with, with the, you know, with the thinking of the leadership, will that be used is against it, them outside I mean, of the classroom or in? But, yep. uh, but isn't that what tenors, tenure is about? Well, protection that of that uh, tenure pro provides additional protections for more senior folks, but if you just allow full censorship of faculty until they reach tenure, then what you mean is a vast majority of your classes are going to be taught by people who aren't freely able to really speak their minds. And the First Amendment and academic freedom doesn't only exist for tenured faculty; it provides additional structural you, have you procedural seen the, protections. Have you seen the uh, paperwork and the agreement between the the the, the graduate student and the university, so you don't know for sure what re rationale they were fired. It wouldn't be constitutional either way. You can't get rid of, of the constitutional free speech rights uh, in the contract like that and still have academic freedom at UNL. And if you're allowing that in your contracts, then you have a much bigger problem here in Nebraska uh, on, 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 in terms of campus free speech, and that is and that is for sure. Um, you, and 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 that and that at the end of the day is really what we're looking at is to make sure that all points of view of people are, are protected. Now, the other thing about this incident, and I don't really want to make this about this incident, because when we're talking about a case, 
you know, and we're talking about a statute. You want a statute that will live in the future and be able to govern how people behave. But with respect to this, you are not talking about a faculty member who got into a confrontation with one of their students. These were you know, two students, one of them also happened to have teaching responsibilities in another school of the campus who got into a heated political argument where I think a lot of people can question the decorum, uh, that's fine, but the First Amendment isn't about those judgments, the First Amendments are about government punishments for engaging in protected speech. And however you want to slice it, it looks pretty protected to us. I mean, certainly there's rounds to, to, to criticize uh, in terms of politeness, et cetera, and, and those who, who want to weigh in and express their disappointment should feel free. A question for you. Um, yeah. Could you field questions and complaints from uh, uh, students? We do. Uh, there was a quote in the paper that this is the only complaint the University of Nebraska has had. Uh, the regents. Uh, yeah. um, what is the attitude you hear from teachers? I hear it all the time from not teachers from students. <laughs> I don't like what's going on in class, but I'm afraid of the intimidation or the repercussions if I would speak up. Do you hear that a lot from students? Isn't that a repression of free speech? We hear that, and we're and and, and, and we are concerned about that. We don't think that anyone is imagining that. You know, there are tremendous amounts of pressures on people to be conformist at institutions. And over time, that may sway in terms of the politics, uh, but, but we hear that quite a bit. And I think that there is, you know, fire represents, again, students on all parts of the political spectrum when they've been censored. But if I had to do a rough in my head kind of head count, when it is about politics, it's a majority of the time it's a conservative student has, who has been censored, at least in 2018 America. And I think that that's because Censorship is nonpartisan. People censor who they disagree with. But the leadership of institutions across the country, if you just did a headcount, more of that is coming from, from the left. So when there is a, a, a ruffling of just you know, c combating friction between you know, the politics of someone who has power and someone who doesn't, that's how we're seeing it unfold too often on college campuses. So there's reason to be involved, but we get concerned when the solutions aren't about protecting everyone's free speech rights, no matter where they come from, because that's really the test of time, is not whether or not we can stand up for the people who we agree with, but when we can stand up for the people who we think have the, the most vile opinions that we Thank can you. think of. Any other questions? Thank you for the challenging and thoughtful uh, questions. I really appreciate it. And I'm here to help throughout the, throughout the process moving forward however we can. Next uh, proponent. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amber Parker, um, A-M-B-E-R, last name Parker, P-A-R-K-E-R, -E and I'm here as a proponent to LB718. It's amazing to me that there is a room full of people here that are going to be opponents to a bill that is proposed to protect freedom of speech on our college campuses here in the state of Nebraska. I myself have never been a college student. I struggled through school, would have flunked grades, another story for another day. But what I will say to you here is that I really do believe that Senator Holleran has something here and was willing to come forward and be put in a lion's den, so to speak. I am tired of seeing the bullying that goes unspoken. I have talked to students. I have worked with other student groups who were even not allowed to have conservative groups on their college campuses. There is definitely something that needs to be done. More concerning, in the Constitution of the United States of America, freedom of speech is a right for every American. I ask you here, what is it for those of you opponents, and I do look forward to hearing, because what I would like to bring up is asking, what is going on the University of Nebraska's campus? Do they only provide the freedom of speech? I would just like to uh, read a posting that I had seen um, on somebody's post. Uh, Kobe Mack had posted this, and it greatly concerned me. It said, sign posted today in the UNL English department. Um, students of color, you are welcome here. Muslim and other non-Christian students, you are welcome here. Queer students, you are welcome here. 
female, genderqueer, and transgender students, you are welcome here. Students with disabilities and non-neurotypical students, you are welcome here. Poor students, you are welcome here. Undocumented students, you are welcome here. You are an invaluable part of our community. I make a commitment to building an inclusive, supportive space where you can thrive. Then it has a heart with a fist in it, black fist, and then it has like a woman's body, and I can't really, it says my body, I can't tell what it says, my something, but then M or F -er. So my question, I hope that those behind us have a good reason to say why they would support if this is something that the English uh, department gave permission to post, I would love to hear the freedom of speech that they should, that they believe should only be spoke on the campuses and remind them that if that is the case, they are not abiding by the Constitution of the United States of America. Thank you. Yeah, any questions? Thank you. Any other proponents? <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Chris Coop, C H R I S space C O U P E. Uh, I'm 30 years old and I've been attending classes at Southeast Community College for over 10 years. I do this part time as a hobby because this is where this there is nowhere I'd rather be than around educated, respectable individuals, and nothing I'd rather be doing than wrestling with the minds of our most educated or to be educated. When it comes to the student experience, not faculty experience, not student working as faculty experience, and not students that have been encouraged because of their favorable viewpoints by faculty, but by my personal student experience is almost unparalleled at Southeast Community College. I read about this bill, I read about it. LB 718 on the Higher Education Free Speech Accountability Act yesterday on NebraskaLegislature.gov slash bills a good source of information. I thought I'd come in here and share a piece of my mind with my fellow citizens and you board members. I'm curious if this bill would prevent a teacher from limiting student speech about certain subject in an introduction to human, com human communications class. In the class I took at Southeast Community College, each student had to write on a sheet of paper what their subject matter would be. Then that piece of paper would be passed around the room and approved by each student or else we would have to pick another subject. Even though I often opted to talk derogatively about Russia in my speeches, I'm happy to report that neither the teacher nor the students objected to my criticisms. However, a student wasn't allowed to debate whether or not AR-15 should be legal or not without the teacher requiring that another student present the other side of the issue wholeheartedly. Keep in mind, not a single student had an issue with it, just the teacher. Although it's always nice to hear both sides of the story, what I find disturbing is that it couldn't be discussed otherwise. It is said that for every hour spent in school, two hours should be spent studying the subject further outside of class. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we be allowed to present one side of the story without safely assuming the students can easily attain the other side of the story after class? Why do we assume negligence on their part? Not only is negligence assumed, but what they are negligent about is also assumed. Anyways, when I challenged the teacher in person what was on their mind when having us abide by these regulations of speech, they said we haven't learned how to argue in an offensive and a non-offensive manner yet, so as to not offend the audience. They said they, they wanted to have controversial debates for more difficult public speaking classes. You see, my fellow citizens and you board members, this they have defined the parameters of the argument inside of our own Southeast Community College. Would this bill hinder or allow for this sort of regulation? I say I probably don't have much time left, but I'm halfway through. That's fine if you don't want to hear this. It's my experience that they first started introducing the idea of controlling language in English classes that I have attended within this past decade at SCC multiple times. This is my hobby. I know what I'm talking about. They instruct you to appeal to your audience, but then they define your audience as either themselves or surrounding peers. Then, then proceed to cite statistics by liberal institutions about how statistically liberal institutions are. You see, my fellow citizens and you board members, they have also defined the audience in our English classes as to define the parameters of the argument. So they're starting in English and they're continuing to communications classes. 
I was talking to a fellow student at Southeast Community College before history class one day about abortion. During our private conversation, another individual was becoming offended by what they were hearing while eavesdropping on us. They were so offended by what they were hearing and were so unable to tune on our private conversation that they stood up and said, can you not talk about this before our test? It was a test day. Maybe our mutual nervousness was egging on some sort of conversation to ease our nerves that we wouldn't have had in the first place. Nonetheless, do you see, my fellow citizens and you board members, how the results are playing out and how sensitive my peers, I'm a millennial, I'm 30, how my people have become. I know, I know how sensitive they've become and I know why too. I use logic to disseminate between hate speech and freedom of speech. So, uh, I s uh, go ahead. Uh, how much more do you have? Um, just to finish this page and it, it ends here, I can probably talk quickly and get it done in 45 could you, seconds. As a question to you, could you recap it without reading it? Uh, I, yeah, I, um, basically I, I've had experiences talking to a logic and philosophy teachers in their cubicle and I like to debate issues. I love it. I just love debating issues and I love the truth. And I debated with this guy and his, he resorted almost immediately to calling me, uh, comparing me to a Nazi SS officer during Nazi Germany times. Um, this is my logic and philosophy teacher. He now teaches comparative religion and he does not allow you to use religious arguments in his philosophy classes. He does not. And so this is really confusing to me. I mean, inside of SEC, there are so many things that are going on and there is nobody paying attention to it. You'll have a poster right here that says, watch out for your health, eat healthy, come over here and eat vegetables for free. And then right next to that poster will say, come here on Sunday, free ice cream Sundays. It's, it just doesn't make any sense. It seems like for every, every step they try to take forward, they're going to take another one back. And I think that there's a lot of bullying and a lot of bias going on at Southeast Community So you Community believe College. there's a lot of intellectual bullying, uh, a form of uh, attack on free speech? I believe that it's bullying, yes. I'm not saying that they would prevent it. I'm saying that they, me especially, because I'm very outspoken at school, I have even liberal professors come up and ask how they can get more attention from their students and get them to speak more and it's 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 because when every time I say something they always have something but to say back you have an advantage you don't care what grade you get you, exactly. you're not trying to get into med school exactly so you don't bite your tongue exactly. you're worrying about retribution on your grading or your or your test scores no just just the I just respect these teachers the grade is what they give me and it just hurts me when they call me names for no reason because it's what they see it, you know, on the TVs in the cafeteria at CNN. You know, they got brand new cafeterias, brand new things at SEC. The teacher, teachers have not improved a dime. Thank you. Is there any other questions? For the testifier. Thank you. Any other proponent? <coughs> We have a letter of support for LB 718 from the Nebraska Taxpayers for Freedom. Opposition. How many opposition do we have? We'll go three minutes, as we'd said earlier. My name is Amanda Gailey, G-A-I-L-E-Y. From the beginning, I approached this bill with a great deal of skepticism. The same senators who are sponsoring this supposed PN to free speech have for months been working to punish a grad student who used words they don't like, have described my silent and civil protest of Turning Point USA as immoral and accosting and a fireable offense. Their political allies have demanded the rescission of the scholarships of black student athletes who peacefully protest state violence and they have demanded the work and private emails of faculty who have criticized them. How do how they square this assault on dissent with a bill that protects, quote, without limitation, ideas and opinions individuals find unwelcome, disagreeable, or even deeply offensive, unquote, requires awe-inspiring gymnastics of hypocrisy. Sure enough, a close reading of this bill reveals ulterior motives I can only briefly explain here. In short, the first part of the bill establishes that sanctions must be taken against anyone on campus who interferes with another's free speech. 
The second part of the bill establishes a committee staffed by regents, faculty, and students with no provisions for how they will be selected, which is worrisome giving t given TPUSA's history with student elections. Further, the bill requires that the committee provide the governor and legislators with a report on any kind of potential free speech issues on campus ahead of the legislative session. In other words, it requires the university to deputize potentially partisan onlookers to supply the governor and legislators the materials to conduct targeted attacks and defamations of campus dissenters for political grandstanding purposes. Finally, section four number two A in the amended bill <coughs> contains buried treasure. It specifies that one barrier to free speech that must be reported will be investigations into students or student organizations for their speech. That's right, the bill characterizes it as a barrier to free speech if someone on campus investigates a student organization for their speech. So you want to know who the Nazis are yelling Jews will not replace us on your quad? Too bad. Senators Halloran, Brewer, and Erdman want to make sure nothing impedes the invitation of Nazis to campus. And once they show up, if you so much as investigate what they are up to or who is behind them, you will have violated their free speech and must be sanctioned. So this bill violates the state constitution, but I'd like it also to be known that the bill, like the senator's behavior these last months, is an attack on the very principles it hides behind. Thank you. Uh, questions? I'm also um, employed at the English department at UNL, and I'm, I can't speak for the department, but if I can, as an individual, lend insight into some of the current claims that have been restoked by people in this room, including people on this committee, I'd be happy to. Well, I will give you a chance because it's out there about the website for the for the university. It's out uh, there. On the English department, and it's got very little to do with Shakespeare or Chauncey or any of those people. Have you looked at our course catalog, sir? Oh, I was just talking about. Do what you I realize was that a class on Shakespeare is taught, I believe, every semester in our department, and that when I listened to inexpert outsiders criticizing our curriculum for teaching social justice issues last fall, I was in the middle of teaching T. S. Eliot, Walt Whitman, and Emily Dickinson in my courses because the people leading this attack have absolutely no interest in the Excuse truth. They are inexperts, and, and, and the I just commented on the websites. The mission, the mission, mission the, yes, the, web, the mission statement is not the course catalog. The course catalog, the course catalog is a catalog. listing of courses. I'm asking that, about some a student, an 18-year-old student in Washington State that looks at and is thinking about majoring in English at the University of Nebraska and looks at your website. Yes, what about them? The mission statement. Right, that's our mission statement, not a course catalog. And thankfully, most of our students are aware of the difference, even if senators on this committee are not. Thank you. I just, you asked me, uh, somebody to let you clarify some questionable stuff that a lot of people have. It's only questionable when ideologically driven inexperts defame, lie, and distort for political purposes and grandstanding purposes. Do you, uh, I'll ask you another question. A young lady testified earlier about the list of who's welcome. Right. Does it offend you? There was nobody, uh, Muslim was there but not Christian? Yeah, or, so a couple things. I believe that free speech or, rights cover, uh, fee, cover speech that we find offensive, correct? That's what this bill is meant to cover. So even if someone in this room finds that signage offensive, it would still be covered by the Free Speech Act. Second of all, another thing that we teach when we study rhetoric is that because you make one claim, it does not preclude other claims from being true. So if I say something like, I appreciate the work of Senator Patty Pansing Brooks, that does not mean that I necessarily don't appreciate the work of anyone else on this committee. Saying that Muslims are welcome in our department does not entail that Christians are not welcome in our department. And if not being included and in having egos coddled constitutes a violation of free speech, I worry about how a policy like the one encoded in this bill would be enacted in practice. But you do understand that political speech leads to perception. And perception leads, leads to funding. And perception leads to enrollment. So are you trying to regulate perception with this bill or free no, speech? No, I am just telling you the political reality of free speech. I thought we were talking about the bill and policy and not whether or not you personally Thank approve you of the perceptions. Answer. Any other questions of that? Thank you.
In the future, we'll take one from the right, one from the left. If we, if you're not planning on testifying, then please don't sit in the front row and people come up <coughs> and uh, let's work toward the center. So we, so everybody knows when their opportunity to speak is. If that would work for everybody. So when you're done speaking, go to the back of the room if you would from the front row. Anytime. Um, we're on a tight schedule, so when you're ready, you go. All right. Thank you very much for, for having me. And first of all, I'd just like to comment that uh, my eye doctor did tell me last week I probably need to get a set of glasses or LASIK done. But in looking at the pictures outside the hall and versus coming in here, I can say that the uh, sense of style with the attire and the haircuts are just noticeably different. So uh, it's, it's uh, just kind of neat to, to walk these halls and respect the, the work that everyone's put in over the years here at the Nebraska Legislature. So thank you, first of all, for your work. Chairman Groney and members of the Education Committee, good afternoon. I am Rob Schaefer, and I am Chairman of the University of Nebraska Board of Regents. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today in, on behalf of the Board in opposition to LB 718. First of all, let me say that we appreciate your attention to these important issues around freedom of expression and civil discourse on college campuses. We welcome these conversations. Our 53,000 students, 187,000 alumni in this state, and all Nebraska taxpayers are too important not to have this dialogue, even when it is challenging. And we certainly recognize that members of the legislature and many Nebraskans are interested in what the university is doing. But I respectfully suggest to you that this bill is the wrong approach. By mandating the development of free speech policies, LB 718 infringes upon the constitutional authority of the Board of Regents to govern the University of Nebraska. This is a responsibility that cannot be delegated, which is why last week, we unanimously endorsed a statement opposing any legislation that usurps the duties of the board. The gentleman who will follow me will go into more detail on this point. What I'd like to do at this point is share with you a few things that the regents are for. I think you will be pleased with some of the steps we have taken recently with regard to free speech and inclusion at the University of Nebraska. I hope these give you a sense that we are taking these issues seriously that we are engaging Nebraskans in the process, and that we are holding ourselves accountable. First, we are for free speech, unequivocally so. A university must be a place where ideas can be freely exchanged and where robust and open dialogue can occur. We could not expect to be able to fulfill our responsibility to create and disseminate new knowledge otherwise. This is a personal issue for me. As a Lieutenant Colonel in the Nebraska Air National Guard, I have a deep, deep appreciation for the values that Americans have fought for and died for. We understand that freedom of expression is essential to our missions of teaching, research, and outreach. As a board, we must do everything we can to govern the university in a way that protects that sacred right. <clears throat> and that is why we are for our new policy on free expression, which is was approved unanimously by the Board of Regents last week after months long of working in a process that included many across the state and that also involved a significant amount of work by our faculty, staff, and students. To be clear, existing board policy explicitly protected the academic freedom of all others of our community, but our new policy reinforces that commitment and outlines specific steps for continued progress. It directs each campus to develop and clearly communicate a plan for which the facilities are open to the public and which spaces, such as a classroom, are not. And it includes what we believe is a unique and innovative mandate to provide First Amendment educational programs across campuses. I would point out that accountability is built into our policy. Early next year, we are requiring the administration to come back to the board with a public report on the facilities use plans in any <coughs> alleged violations of our policy and any actions taken as a result. 
as well as First Amendment educational opportunities that were provided. This is an important part of our policy that will allow us to, as a governing board and all Nebraskans, to monitor and evaluate <coughs> our process. I'm personally pleased with the work that has been done over the past few years to advance free expression at the University of Nebraska. Most of the recent headlines have been about a single incident last fall on one of our campuses. It was an unfortunate incident which demonstrated that our work is never done when it comes to making our university a more welcoming, welcoming place for all. But an isolated occurrence should not color what is truly a positive story for our university and our state. The reality is that we have been engaged on these issues for a number of years. We are making meaningful progress with the help of Nebraskans, and we are in a great position to be a leader in this conversation that is taking place across college campuses across the country. I feel very good about where we are headed together and where our potential to be is to become even stronger. Working together, we can accomplish great things on behalf of our students and the people of Nebraska. We welcome the opportunity for members of the legislature to be involved as we continue to move forward. We know we share the same goals for making sure every student has an outstanding experience, that our campuses are places where all can participate in the free exchange of ideas and where all views can be respectfully heard. While I am confident that we can find a path forward together, the mandates imposed by LB 718 go too far. The Board of Regents is the independent body with the constitutional authority to manage and operate the University of Nebraska. Therefore, I respectfully ask you not to advance this bill. Thank you for your time, and most importantly, thank you for your service and hard work on behalf of our great state. I would be pleased to respond to your questions. Any questions? Uh, Regent, uh, I'm looking at the budget bill from two years ago. It says we will give three million three hundred ninety eight thousand for the Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture, uh, two million eight hundred thousand Nebraska Forest Service program. And I remember two years ago my first year here we, we dictated that two and a half, three maybe it was five million would go to a Clayton Guider chair. Also remember dictating that $25 million would go to a virtual reality uh, UNMC building. Is that unconstitutional that we dictated those funding to a certain source? I, I think it's clear under the Exxon case that uh, the legislature's purpose and role is to work with the university as far as establishing funding. Um, I, we dictated that you had to create this chair for Clayton Yider. I, I believe the strings were tied to the financing, though, and I think that's different than what we're talking about today. I think funding money is also the use of it as free speech, is it not? Um, I, I believe then we're getting into the minutia of the daily management and operations of the university. I think that's where there's probably a disagreement as far as, uh, you know, I believe, I'm a strong believer in less government and it ought to be controlled at a local level. I mean. The University of Nebraska Board of Regents is the governing authority for the university, and I'm a strong believer that we need less government involved in that process, not more. So if Senator Holland would have uh, had an A bill of two million to establish a new free speech, maybe we could have got it passed. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about that. Uh, I'm just kidding you. <laughs> anyway, are there any other questions? Senator Pandon Brooks. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Regent Schaefer. Appreciate your service. Uh, have you seen the the amendment of Senator Halloran? As far as the have you seen his amendment? I've seen the, the amendment as far as addressing the uh, state colleges and the community colleges, yes. So not not the full amendment though? I think that is the full. I, 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 yes, I'm not aware of another okay. amendment. Okay, well, that's a, so that's a yes, right? Okay, that'd be a yes. Okay. okay. All right. And so, are you? And how do you feel about that amendment? Have you have you felt that it changes anything, or if it is adopted? I don't believe that changes anything as it pertains to the university. All right. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Appreciate thank it. you for having me. Any other questions? Senator Menahan. Thank you, Chairman Grumman. 
Uh, I have a question on your page three. Thank you for being here. And it's more just kind of a, I mean, I don't expect you to have an answer, but the middle paragraph in the third sentence, it directs each campus to develop and clearly communicate a plan for which facilities are to be public and which basis, such as a classroom, are not. So uh, as much kind of uh, angst as there has been over this issue, does it make sense that each campus come up with this? Wouldn't it? I think or the am I misunderstanding is, this? No, I believe the campuses are in a much better position to dictate that. They, they know the campuses. The Board of Regents isn't going to go and do a, an inspection of each campus and designate it. It's just the same as if, you know, I, I assume you have freedom of speech issues here. Out on the steps is free, but I probably wouldn't be free to come in during another hearing and stand in the back in my loudest voice and read the Bible. Um, so I think that's, it's, again, leave it to those that There's are most closely related in operations to specific campuses or programs in that situation to make those decisions. Okay. All right, thank you. A question. Sure. Across the country we, we hear about flashy news where somebody's been denied, this, the, the administration denied a group to bring in Ann Coulter, the famous one, and wouldn't allow him on campus. Uh, does your does your new uh, free speech uh, take the administration's authority authority out to limit who can speak and who can't speak on the campus? Or can the administration still veto? I, the administration should not be in a position to veto just based upon the content of one speech. Now, if it's someone that's coming in and being offensive or going to create a safety hazard or you know something of that nature and then that's completely different but I believe that there has to be some some ability at some point though to say you know what we've got uh, someone's phoned in a uh, sent an anonymous letter saying they're gonna blow something up if so-and-so speaks well do we make a decision to bring that person in to speak or not I don't know that that's, that would be a, a tough decision to make, but, but I think we need to keep our eyes open. And part of this policy, it looks like uh, if a group wants to bring somebody in and talk to their group, they will be able to use your facilities. Oh, yeah, I, I, I think that's would be more than appropriate. And it shouldn't matter if you're far from the left or far from the right. We should uh, welcome all, all speech. I didn't ask we should. Do you and your policy allow that? Yes. All right, thank you. But we don't want to be censuring speech. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Okay. For taking the time. You bet. Thank you again for having me. The next opponent. Good afternoon. My name is Jay Grayball, J-A-Y-G-R-A-B-O-W. I am honored to read a statement in opposition to this bill from Courtney Lawton. My name is Courtney Lawton. I am the reason Senator Halloran brought this bill. I am a PhD candidate in good standing at the University of Nebraska and have received excellent student evaluations in my five years as a teaching assistant. Senator Halloran, the introducer of this bill along with co-sponsors, have targeted me for their own political gain. On August 25th, I protested Turning Point USA, a billionaire funded organization that has been intimidating faculty nationwide through their professor watch list and the use of paid staffers who create infamatory social media ca campaigns. After verifying that TPUSA was not a registered student organization, I made a sign that read, quote, just say no to neo-fascism, unquote. I stood near the TPUSA recruitment table with my back to the staffer. She came out from behind her table to take photo and video of me to send back to TPUSA. I raised my middle finger to show my contempt for her organization. 
I walked around the area calling for calling her a quote neo-fascist Becky unquote a woman who weaponizes her whiteness I decried her organization which is anti-public school anti-university and anti-DACA I was joined at various times by as many as four people I never blocked access to the TPUSA table I never shouted at the staffer and I never engaged her in conversation far from being silenced the staffer hosted a TPUSA table the next day the next school day in the same place I also saw her on campus outside my work building with a gigantic beach ball that read quote free speech unquote on September 11th she felt free to attend a public hearing of the Lincoln City Council to testify with two members of the neo-Nazi group Blood and Soil against a resolution condemning the violent white nationalist presence in Charlottesville, Virginia. Following this brief encounter, I was the target of a smear campaign in social media. I received violent threats against my person, my family, and my career. I was removed from the classroom because of concerns for my own and my students' safety. Months later, after pressure from Senators Halloran, Erdman, and Brewer, and, and Regent Hal Dobb, I was prohibited from teaching ever again at UNL. My education and training have been disrupted because of lies and distortions spread by TPUSA and elected officials. The Nebraska Republican Party has subjected me to a search of my university email account. Republican politicians, including this bill's introducer, punished me because they don't believe in free speech. They believe in suppression of dissent. The very people that claim to be protecting academic freedom and free speech with this bill are the ones who have spent the last five, <coughs> five months destroying my life and interfering with my scholarship because they disagree with my politics. I want the record to be clear. The politicians who wrote this bill are not champions of free speech. They have actually worked for months at the behest of Governor Pete Ricketts to crush and silence political dissent. They will never silence me. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? No questions. Since she isn't here to answer, it's best nobody asks, at least from my point. So thank you. Do you have a question, Senator? No, because she's not here to answer them. Those are her words, and I don't want to anybody to put words in her mouth, me or you. So anyway, is uh, the next, any other questions? <coughs> thank you. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm John Wiltsey, J-O-H-N-W-I-L-T-S-E. I'm currently the Deputy General Counsel for the University of Nebraska. I say currently because I'm retiring and tomorrow's my last day. <laughs> I've been a lawyer since 1981. I'm admitted to practice before the Nebraska Supreme Court, the United States District Court for the District of Nebraska, the Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, and the Supreme <coughs> Court of the United States. I'm a grandson of John Wiltsey, whose name appears on page 84 of the 2013 pamphlet edition of the Nebraska Constitution, distributed by the clerk of the legislature. But enough about me. I'm here to oppose LB 718, read for the first time on January the 3rd. An amendment was introduced by the bill's sponsor on January the 17th. That amendment is identified as AM 1553. There may have been a more recent amendment that I have not seen. I understand that bills have been introduced in other states, but those don't concern me. What matters most to me is the legal context here. There is no other place like Nebraska after all. As you've already heard from Chairman Schaefer on January 25th, the Board of Regents adopted a commitment to free 
Expression, Guide for Facilities Use and Education Policy. I believe you may have been provided with copies of that policy. There is work yet to be done to implement the policy, but I ask you to consider whether this bill is necessary in light of the university's policy. You should be aware as well that the university's bylaws have contained a statement that, quote, institutional control of campus facilities should not be used as a device of censorship since August of 1973. There is a question whether the adoption of this act would be consistent with Board of Regents B. Exxon. That case, in that case, the Supreme Court said that it is the duty of the legislature to implement the constitutional provision by enacting legislation that vests the general government of the university in the Board of Regents. That case struck down laws dealing with university facilities because those facilities relate to a function of the general government of the university. In my opinion, LB 718 would not pass constitutional muster under Exxon. I've tried to avoid legal technicalities, but there's a part of LB 718 in the proposed amendment. You'd find it in section three, subsection six and seven. It states that the governing body shall adopt a policy which at a minimum contains a provision that the public areas of a campus are traditional public forums open on the same terms to any speaker. What I want to say here is that I'm not aware of any controlling court decision that has found that college or university campuses are traditional public forums. Traditional public forum is a legal term that has not been applied to university property in my written testimony, which I'll provide copies of, I quote at length from Bowman, uh, Bowman v. White, which is an Eighth Circuit decision that was handed down in 2016. In the interest of time, I will not read that quotation to you, but you're welcome to read it. Thank you very much for allowing me to address the committee. Unless you have any questions for me, I leave it you to your important work. Any questions? Uh, so you're not saying that the, it's not a public forum, the university property? I am saying that university property is not a traditional public forum. So they have the right to decide who speaks and who doesn't on their property? The university has a right to control the property that it was entrusted with. The purpose of university property is to further the mission of the university, which is education, research, teaching, service, and extension. So they could interpret that to decide who speaks and who doesn't on their property? Yes, they could have a designated public forum and allow persons to use that if they wish. But could they also decide who is allowed to speak and who isn't? Yes, sir, they could. They could? Yes, sir. So they could say, we don't like what that person has to say, so therefore we do not want to hear them. They could not make a decision based on the content of the speech or the viewpoint. They could make a, a distinction based on subject matter. They could open up a forum for the purpose of only discussing law or only discussing Shakespeare. They can make distinctions based on the status of the speaker, namely an enrolled student, an admitted student, a member of the faculty, a member of the staff. But the key distinction between a designated public forum in a traditional public forum is that someone who is not affiliated from the university with the university would have the right to use property that is classified as a traditional public forum. The university is not a park, it is not a public street, which is, these are the prototypical examples of a traditional public forum. The university is many things, but it, its lands are dedicated to the mission of the university. So somebody couldn't come on the campus and put a peach box up and start quoting the Declaration of Independence they could, uh, if they weren't a student? If the university was not willing to allow that to happen at that particular space, that's correct. On the Exxon case, it, I've got a couple lawyers, so I'm not one, but I can read law. Yes. Uh, it's in English. Uh, yes. Let, legislature is allowed to give the Board of Regents general duties. But they can't be so detailed as to how to do it. Yes. You can give them a duty to say, make sure there is a free speech policy. 
that it protects the rights of all citizens to speak, no matter if they are a, a student or not. And then we direct you to set up the policy. Is that not clear? It is not clear from the way that the court wrote that decision that that's what the court is commanding, especially if you're saying that, as I've tried to say, I don't believe that the legislature can direct the university to create a traditional public forum. And well, we can give you a duty, a general duty. There is language. Who yes, defines in, general duty? The next court case, is that not correct? <clears throat> that could result in the next court case, yes. And it could go either way, depending on what the judge believes the definition of a general duty is. I'd like is to think true? it's not as variable as just an individual judge. I but think it's I'll disagree with you on that. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I think we have enough history of that. Uh, Dred Scott and a few other ones where it, a judge does make a difference in how things are interpreted. I think that was a U.S. Supreme Court case de still a judge. decided by still a judge. the... But anyway, any, that's, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Hi, my name is Julie Nichols, J-U-L-I-E, N-I-C-H-O-L-S, and I'm here on behalf of myself and uh, students, just general students. Um, I'm sorry, I am going to talk about the First Amendment. I know that that's been pointed out that we shouldn't talk about it, but I think this is the time. I thank you for giving me the accessibility to my lawmakers. I really appreciate the ability to come here and know the faces of the people that we've elected. But with due respect to the committee gathered here and to the authors of this draft, I believe LB 718 wishes to reiterate and improve upon the First Amendment while simultaneously violating it. I object to LB 718 for the following reasons. The bill is redundant. Freedom of expression <coughs> and activities related to it are covered by UNL policy and the First Amendment. As a former employee of UNL during a period spanning a decade, I trust that the mechanisms of the university exist to handle matters and complaints regarding alleged violations or attempts to violate free speech within the university community. LB 718 actually and ironically seeks to violate the First Amendment by interfering in the processes of academic free speech through an undue focus on reporting, monitoring, targeting, and sanctioning those who violate the provisions of the bill. The Regents Committee proposed herein to regulate speech cannot have authority to censor students, staff, or professors' speech as UNL remains a public university committed to the principles described in Section 3 of this draft, Paragraph 1 of this proposed bill. It is the purpose of higher education to encourage discourse, not deem what type of discourse is more or less valuable to students. The public, by virtue of the First Amendment, has a duty to concern itself with attempts on the part of any governing body, including the legislature of the state of Nebraska, its individual members, and or the governor, to restriction of free speech, particularly in higher education, and particularly in a public university. Threats of censorship, exemplified as sanctions, or attempts to identify and target individuals and departments that seek to preserve the public dialogue and to stimulate critical thinking, are the stuff of authoritarian governments, not republics. It is the mandate of certain disciplines, the study of law among them, that educators and staff at a university encourage students and staff to partake in a collegial and accepting environment 
that includes open discourse. Section 8 of this bill lacks definition of what consists of infringement and promises a punitive response through undefined sanctions. Section 9 furthers the punitive nature of this bill by asserting repeat violators. This indicates an agenda on the part of this bill to restrict free discourse and to silence those who practice it as part of their responsibility within administrative and teaching duties. This bill, by virtue of creating a committee under charge of the Board of Regents, seeks to violate the higher authority of the Bill of Rights. Furthermore, the Committee on Free Expression, as described in this proposal, echoes another allegedly purposeful tribunal, the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Please reject this bill based on its clear violation of the Constitution, what I feel is its clear violation, and its suggestion that the committee created through its enactment would empower a few individuals to violate the rights of students, faculty, and staff at a public institution. To illustrate what goes on in a free learning environment, the following quotes have been compiled from a variety of classroom experiences in public institutions. Quote, if I found out my dentist was a lesbian, I'd puke on her shoes, unquote. Quote, stupid towel heads can't speak English, unquote. Quote, that long-haired kid, he's a fucking drug addict, unquote. Quote, they should round all those faggots up and put them on an island somewhere, unquote. Quote, they're a bunch of Jesus jumpers, unquote. Quote, Indians are stupid, pilgrims are cool, unquote. Should those students be reported? Do you have any questions for me that I probably can't answer? Could you give us more detail where those quotes came from? Um, let's see. I those quotes, care. two of them came in a UNL classroom. Um, one from a middle school. One at Hofstra University on Long Island in a written report. And another so one from hears, UNL. So hearsay. Did you hear them yourself? I heard them myself, yes. Heard, I was present. I have two of those in your classroom. Uh, no, all of these. You were at the hospital. So I was either in the classroom or I was teaching in that classroom. Thank you. Well, that clarifies it. Okay. Thank you. Makes That's what fine. you say more pertinent. I did want to point out, um, since there's been uh, an ongoing struggle to define what should be allowed on university campuses, and there seem to be concerns by um, uh, groups that feel they're getting the short end of the stick in terms of their exposure of their ideas or ideologies, that the last time a speaker was denied uh, a scheduled uh, speaking engagement at the University of Nebraska. It was William Ayers who was a member of the SDS and Weather Underground. So it was not, in fact, a conservative that was disallowed their speaking engagement at UNL. Anybody else want to chime in? As to your quotes, it was in your classroom. I'm, I'm apparently, I was either present in that classroom or it was my classroom, yes. And that was free speech, as negative and as bad as it was. What did I what yes. was your point? That, that, um, that you didn't my point them out? is that this goes on within classrooms as part of an educational discourse. And no disciplinary action was taken in your classroom. Um I in my personal classroom yeah. when I was conducting discussion. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that it's appropriate to discipline people for the manner of their speech. I feel that the function of discourse is to understand one another. Right, That's what it's for. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Yeah. 
Well, Senator Rep. Sorry. Can, um, I, I spent more years than I want to admit in graduate school. Um, and, and, I spent more money <laughs> than I want to admit in graduate school. Um, and, and, and experienced a lot of the kind of collegial discourse that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do you define that? Um, I what, think. What were, the, were the quotes that you just that you just named? Was that an example of collegial discourse? I think it's an example of how people talk and how they should also be allowed to talk, however offensive I found, found those all, all of those statements to be. It was not my job in a classroom where I was not teaching or a classroom where I was teaching to make a judgment upon those because what you're trying to do is get uh, people of differing viewpoints and differing ideologies to understand one another and to be able to discuss those openly. So, you know, if you uh, turn people loose with that, then it's not always going to sound nice. I'm not talking about sounding nice, but I mean, it, it, there, there is something to be said for, I mean, I, I'm all for disagreements. I had more disagreements in, right. um, in, in graduate seminars than, you know, I mean, that happened all the time. Mm -hmm. But then afterwards, we went out and had a beer. Yeah. You know, I mean, does, does that still happen anymore? Do, do I, I hope so. Fine, you know? I think so. I don't think that um, we're all in a world That's where, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'll, I'll have a beer with, I, I'd have a beer with you. In fact, I tried to in Crete one night, but well, I learning. didn't make it out there. Okay, well, <laughs> come on up. Come I, I would cheap, love I to, you actually. Yeah. <laughs> and I appreciate that you make yourself available in that way to talk to a lot of different people with the different ideas. But I do think that's what the classroom on a certain level is, is for. Yes, if it's not my classroom, I'm not going to call that speech down until it becomes so heated that it's really inappropriate. Do, do you think there's anything different between a college classroom or graduate classroom and um, you said one of those comments was from a middle school. Mm -hmm. is, is there a difference? I think there is. I think that public schools have their own policies about that. Um, I was not a teacher in that setting. Um, so I didn't. But you heard it in that setting. Yes, I heard it in that setting. Thank you. How many more? What's that? You trying to rush me along? No. I don't say anything, and then you're trying to rush me along. No. That's an expert. Are you trying to suppress her speech? No. <laughs> <laughs> you already suppressed mine earlier today. You can, today, you can so. speak as much as you want, as long as I can speak over the top of you. All the people. I did. How many more testifiers are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, I'm sorry. All right, thank you. Chairman Groney, members of the committee, my name is Eric Berger, E R I C B E R G E R. I'm a professor of law here at the University of Nebraska College of Law. My pr primary area is constitutional law, including the First Amendment. I'm speaking here on my own behalf against LB 718. In addition to these oral remarks, I have written much more detailed testimony, which I'll distribute after I speak, and the written testimony elaborates on the basic points I'll make now. The First Amendment's commitment to free speech is sacred in our society. It's a big part of what makes the United States a special country. Please know that I certainly share a devotion to the First Amendment values that I assume inspired LB 718. However, I oppose this bill for two basic reasons. First, I think LB 718 is a quintessential example of big government overregulation. Second, though as I understand it, the bill is attempting to protect the First Amendment, it actually intrudes on freedom of speech in several ways. For these reasons, the bill will likely have unintended consequences that will chill far more speech than it protects. So my first objection is that LB 718 imposes a burdensome big government regulatory scheme on higher public education in Nebraska. It's a basic principle of sound government that legislatures should not impose overbroad regulatory schemes that create more problems than they solve. To be clear, I agree entirely that it's important to give students wide leeway to exchange their views and to expose them to ideas and writings they may find disagreeable. However, as an educator, I also know that teachers are most effective when they can select the educational methods that work best for those goals. 
To that extent, LV 718 undermines good education because it infringes on university instructors and administrators' ability to figure out how to best educate students. Now, of course, instructors and administrators don't do their jobs perfectly. Nobody does. However, they are much better positioned to make sound educational decisions than legislators dictating a regulatory scheme from on high. My second objection to LB 718 is that it violates the First Amendment in several ways. Though I understand the sponsors here want to protect freedom of speech, it actually, the bill actually undermines freedom of speech. The way to protect the First Amendment is not to pass a bill that violates the First Amendment. First, many of the provisions are confusing, so it's difficult actually to know what speech is protected and what speech is prohibited. I teach statutory interpretation, but I had trouble making heads or tails out of some of the bill's provisions. This textual incoherence is actually a serious constitutional defect. A core tenet of First Amendment doctrine is that courts will strike down vague laws regulating speech. A law is unconstitutionally vague if a reasonable person cannot tell what speech is permitted and what speech is prohibited, and this criticism applies to many provisions of this bill. Many of the provisions also raise other First Amendment problems. For example, Section 3, Clause 2 states it's not the proper role of the campus to shield individuals from free speech. It's unclear exactly what this means, but it seems like it, it could require instructors to assign particular material. To this extent, this provision likely infringes on a teacher's First Amendment rights to decide what to teach. Section 3, Clause 3 stipulates institutions shall not require students, faculty, or administrators to publicly express, express views on given co on controversies. This seems to mean that a professor could not assign a debate position to a student in a class about current events. It's obviously crucial for students to learn how to debate controversial issues, and a professor sure. could reasonably decide... Can you wrap it up? Yes. A professor could reasonably decide that this is a good educational uh, viewpoint, uh, also, the bill is th that provision also prevents campus administrators from representing the campus's position on public controversies, and campus administrators clearly have that First Amendment right. The, pr the provision, the bill in Section 3, Clause 9, also states that protests and demonstrators that material and substantially infringe on others shall not be permitted. That's unconstitutional. It's not uncommon in outdoor public settings to have one protest group matched by other protest groups. How do we figure out who's a protester and who's a counter-protester? Uh, the, the bill seems to delegate this determination, the kind of standardless discretion that the First Amendment prohibits. So we need to wrap. Okay, so I'll just summarize my three basic points. So the bill would have unintended consequences in silencing some speakers I imagine you all would want to protect. Parts of the bill certainly violate the First Amendment, and the bill would invite expensive lawsuits to figure out the law's meaning and its constitutionalities. So thank you for your time, Senators, and I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Any questions? Senator Pansy Brooks. Thank you for coming today, uh, Professor Berger. Uh, I think that the university is fortunate to have you. I know that you are considered an expert nationally on constitutional law, so I appreciate your position and viewpoint. And clearly, uh, as a former law student, if we were at the law school, we, we argued controversial issues all the time. So if a, if a teacher assigns something controversial right there, it seems like we'd be violating this law. So I appreciate your coming. Well, well, thank you for that, Senator. I certainly think that's something we, we do well at the law school and that we pride ourselves on is debating controversial issues and having people from all sides of the political spectrum engage with each other in respectful disagreement. Uh, that's certainly an important part of a legal training, and I think we do that well. And I worry like a, that a bill like this could, could tie our hands and chill both professors and students' speech and thereby undermine the value we provide to, to our students and to the state. And also, uh, I had some of my most uh, controversially, controversially, sorry. this is late. It's 6 o'clock. Yeah, it is 6 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> Conservative professors at the university, I was able to listen to what they had to say and move on. And, and I, I presume there are still professors on both sides of the spectrum at, that, at the school. So certainly at the law school, we have great ideological diversity, great political diversity. We have professors on the very far right, professors on the far left, everything in between. Um, and I think that's valuable for students to hear that wide range of opinions. 
Um, and I also think we do, we, we certainly try to, and I frankly think we do a good job of modeling respectful disagreement. We often will have panels where we discuss the same issues together and we'll disagree, but I think that kind of uh, in public disagreement about public issues is an important part of, of certainly a legal education, but an education more generally. And uh, again, a bill that, that uh, might make people worry that they're stepping afoul of this legislature worries me that it could it, it could corrupt what I think is a very healthy educational uh, experience. Now, I'm glad that things haven't changed at the law school since I was there, and uh, now we have the leadership of, of Dean Moberly, and we're still going forward in that manner. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm glad we have the leadership of Dean Moberly, too, and thank you for your question, Senator. Lenham. Thank you, Chairman Gurney. You used a word in your uh, comments that I think is very important, and. And I think it's missing from the overall conversation here, respectful. So where's the line? And you obviously uh, train people to be in professional law, which has to be respectful to be any good. So where does it come where the professor or the student or where where does that come in? So I mean, having a disagreement on policy is one thing, but how you respect people. That's part of the university's mission too, right? So I'll give you an educational answer and a constitutional answer. The educational answer is that uh, I try to get my students to engage in respectful disagreement. I actually think the students here, my students and all of our law students do an excellent job of that. Uh, I have students on the right and on the left who are great friends with each other and they love to debate ideas but they always do it respectfully. I think that's a very important part of being a good lawyer is to express disagreement in a, in a cogent but a very respectful manner, and I think that's an important part of, of what we train our students to do. Uh, as a constitutional matter, free speech is protected, whether it's respectful or not. Uh, there's certainly speech that I find disagreeable, uh, that I find even obnoxious, but part of the point of the First Amendment is it protects the speech that most or all of us hate, and, to the, and, and the reason for that is the justices on the U.S. Supreme Court and experts in the First Amendment realize that to really protect important free speech, you need to give wide leeway um, so that we don't chill important speech and that if we were to try to prohibit or punish disrespectful speech, that would have the negative consequence of chilling important speech. So the, the whole premise of the First Amendment is we give wide leeway to, to speech, uh, including speech that you know, you and I might agree is, is unfortunate. Thank you. To follow up on that, speech does not have to be cordial. That's correct, Senator. Uh, have you read the university's uh, uh, policy? The, the, the new policy yes. by the Board of Regents? I've read it. I can't profess to be an expert in everything in it, but you I've read it. You didn't find anything objectionable about that? It? You know, I don't want to, you know, I, was, I didn't come well, prepared to speak example. on that, example. but I would. Let me give you an example. The university will not facilitate expression in violation of the law that poses an unreasonable threat to the safety of the university and community. Certain kinds of expression, among others, such as speech that incites violence, fighting words, speech that defames or defrauds, speech that constitutes a genuine threat, unlawful discrimination, or speech that unlawfully invades privacy is not protected speech. Who defines that? So these, this, so what this policy is, is this trying. Constitution. So what this policy is trying to do is it is car, the, the Supreme Court has carved out particular categories of less protected speech, um, and it is those kinds of speech government, including a public university, can regulate. So for for example, an incitement to violence is a less protected category of speech that can be regulated. Each of these categories, or, or I should say most of these categories, have been defined by the U.S. Supreme Court in constitutional cases. So with the example of incitements to violence, uh, in a case called Brandenburg, the U.S. Supreme Court defined an incitement to violence uh, quite quite narrowly. So in other words, uh, unless it fits the specific definition, it's fully protected so you speech. Believe if somebody at the university understands. Oh yes, absolutely. I, it, I don't know who drafted this, but just looking at the list, it seems pretty clear to me that they knew the Supreme Court doctrine and they were trying to incorporate that doctrine into the, into the policy so to be consistent. So a student would know what speech that unlawfully invades privacy would be. 
I don't know if a student, I, I don't know if a student would know. I also, um, but, but uh, I, I hope my students would know. Um, um, you know, so, but the, you know, the, 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 I think the purpose is to say, and again, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing and I, I, I can't summarize the entire region's speech policy, but I think the general purpose is to say, we at the university deeply value free speech. However, there are certain kinds of speech that even in a community where we value free speech, they're too dangerous, a true threat. If a student threatens to kill another student, that's technically speech, but the Supreme Court has made clear that kind of speech is uh, is less protected by the First Amendment. So I, I think that's that's what the university is. You said trying earlier to do. that you have uh, uh, personnel. Is that were you talking about the law college that are ultra conservative and some that are ultra liberal? Yes, I teach at the law college, so, so that's my that's, experience. That was what you're basing your example on. Yes, not other departments. Well, I know in other. I, I I am aware of and know professors in other parts of the university who are also far in the right or far in the left or everywhere Have in between. You but in the English department that's far in the right? I don't teach in the English department. I cannot comment on the politics of the English department. Or the social science department or the, the Department know. of Education department. Have you have you met any of those? Know of any of those? I don't know if I know I don't know if we have a social science department. No, I don't know if I know anyone in the education department. department. I can't speak to the politics of, of people who I don't work with, but I... Well, I just wanted to clarify <laughs> that you're talking about the people you know and the department you know. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Senator? I haven't said okay. anything all yes. day. Give your lectures for the record. Everybody gets one lecture. <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, welcome to the committee, Professor Berger. Professor Berger was my con law professor and my statutory interpretation of professor, so you can blame him for anything you disagree with me on. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Senator. <laughs> But in any case, I can, I can confirm for the committee there are conservative faculty members at the College of Law. I debated Professor Duncan for an hour and a half in his class on the merits of the, uh, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act. So <laughs> that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senators. My name is Judy King, J-U-D-Y-K-I-N-G. I'm here to testify in opposition to LB 718. We have freedom of speech at the universities. The First Amendment has done a great job of protecting our freedom of speech for over 200 years. Senator Halloran's bill does nothing to improve upon the First Amendment. It only creates confusion as to what exactly changes with the bill. Also, it, it is ironic that this bill that supposedly champions free speech on campus for everyone is coming from senators who have been attacking the faculty at the university for engaging in peaceful protest and exercising their freedom of speech. It makes me think that the bill has an ulterior motive because clearly the senators sponsoring the bill have no respect for faculty speech. In fact, they had hoped that the organization FIRE Foundation for Individual Rights in Education would take a look at the University of Nebraska. FIRE did this and concluded that the campus protest against Turning Point USA is well within the rights afforded by the First Amendment. <clears throat> in response, those senators condemned the findings of FIRE, the very organization they claimed to be authoritative on this topic. So this is, a, so this is not about a freedom of speech. It is about partisan legislators trying to control the campus. Um, I was walking through the campus one day to get my football tickets and ran upon a, came upon a table um, that was run by Turning Point. And I thought, hey, great, free speech, you know? I'm an activist, so I thought, hey, I'm going to stop and talk to those kids. I thought, that's cool. So I stopped and talked to them, and uh, I said, I told those kids that, you know, getting involved in important issues, that's great. And then later on in September of 2017, I saw Caitlin Mullen, who was one of the kids at that table, testifying against a city council resolution 
along with two other men who reportedly are white nationalists, which is short for neo-Nazi, and one of these individuals had previously been seen on the state capitol steps wearing a brown shirt holding a sign that said blood and soil and I found that alarming. As a side note, the city resolution was a bipartisan resolution. This was a resolution that called for a celebration of diversity and intolerance of hate and violence. After doing some research, I found that the people involved in Turning Point are not the conservative group for free speech, but white nationalists partly white nationalists involved in the exact opposite, shutting down free speech, just like the Nazis tried to do. The legislatures are turning into the thought police in a bastion which should be prized for free thinking and speech. They are using the same playbook as the pro-life groups, using the term pro-life when they actually mean anti-abortion. Some of the pro-life groups will vote for one thing, anti-abortion. Nothing else matters to them. Some of the pro-life groups do not care that the politician they vote for also buys illegal drugs to murder inmates that may or may not be guilty for a politician who sends, or for a politician who sends money back to, to back a pedophile like Moore in Alabama. Our legislatures are doing the same thing with this issue. They're using the term free speech to actually curtail free speech for some. That's all I have to say. Any questions? I want to clarify something okay. for the record. Okay. I've heard two people say this, Caitlin, I've never met her. I don't know anything about Turning Point, what I read in the paper. And these two white nationalists at the same city council testifying for free speech or something. Mm -hmm. How do you draw the connection that they're... That Did you read her, uh, read her, I didn't bring her statement that she read, but I can get it for you if you'd like. It, and to, to say that you are not for a resolution against hate? No, I, I, I'm you just, know? There's, you got freedom of association too and happen to be in the same mm -hmm. room with somebody. No, Doesn't but I also did research you, on you Turning can, you Point. You can infer that they believe the same thing. Correct, I'd agree with you on that. All right. Uh, but I did research on Turning Point and okay. found out some of their donors and, and I can bring that in to you and share it with you if you'd like. I just want clarification. Okay. Good. Thank you. See it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next testifier. I was going to say good afternoon, but I guess it's good evening now. The senators. Um, I'm here, I'm speaking for myself. Um, I'm also speaking on behalf of my siblings who went to higher education, uh, two of my sons who graduated from higher education schools, my youngest who has got one year left at UNL. Did you give your name and spell it? Oh, Susan Watson, S-U-S-A-N-W-A-T-S-O-N. And my parents who attended higher education. My father actually went to law school here and in the middle of school went to serve in the army and they raised me with a very high respect for freedom of speech. In fact, after the situation in Charlottesville, I called my father first thing, asked him what he thought of it and he said, well, they have a right to free speech. So it's really an important issue to me. But this bill, is not a protection of free speech. In fact, it will punish those who use free speech to protest against any speech, including hate speech of all types. This bill is unpatriotic and probably unconstitutional. The US Constitution already allows for the freedom of speech for all persons in the First Amendment. Reading through this bill, it is obvious that it is protecting some individuals' right to free speech, yet it is limiting others. It is clear that even groups like hate groups would be able to promote their propaganda. They do have a right to free speech. But if students protested them or even engaged them in debate or discussion, their mess and their message could not easily be heard or be engaged in by other students who wanted to talk to them, that could be enough to be called an infringement. If you were just debating them on their issue, that could be an infringement and be called cause for sanctions. 
even as they would be exercising their same constitutional right for free speech. And I don't understand how you consider this fair and equal treatment under the law. It is equality before the law, that's our state motto. That is actually democracy in action. This bill would cost the state of Nebraska a great deal of money defending it against legitimate claim of unconstitutionality. You must remember at all times, this is from the Omaha World Herald, you must remember at all times that the Nebraska Constitution bars the legislature from dictating policy to the NU Board of Regents. You had mentioned that it is the discretion of the Board of Regents um, that you can direct policy to them, but you cannot dictate to them how they um, act on that policy. But that's exactly what you've done to do, <coughs> how and how, how and what to do in Section 4, Paragraph 1 of the Committee on Free Speech, Expression, um, Committee on Free Expression. You've told them how many uh, members they have to have, what they have to do to report to you, all those things. So I think you need to not let this bill out of committee. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Thank you. Good evening, Senators, Chair. I'm really excited to be here as a part of Nebraska's second house today. I'd like to talk about why I don't think Bill uh, LB 718 should advance. Um, unlike Senator Moorfeld, who had the... Did you, did you give your name? Oh, I apologize. Uh, my, Danielle Savington, that's D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E-S-A-V-I-N-G-T-O-N. -E -E and I did not get to take Professor Berger's class. I was in the other con law class. And while you got to debate uh, Professor Duncan for funsies, I had to debate Professor Duncan, who is a nationally re renowned constitutional scholar who is also extremely ultra-conservative, um, for my grade. And I did that because adulting. Um, I think this bill, first and foremost, treats college students like adult-minded children, and they are not. They may be young, but they are adults, and they have the right and the duty to go to college and be exposed to ideas that they don't necessarily hold closely and dearly to their own hearts. I think that process should begin as early as possible, and I think that the university has policies in place that allow a student to say, wait, hold up, my teacher graded me unfairly or my teacher treated me unfairly because of my political ideology. I don't think that this bill supports their ability to be adults at all. Additionally, um, I like to talk about fiscal responsibility. And um, <coughs> just last week, NU Regents were quoted in the Lincoln Journal Star on January 25th as saying that further budget cuts would be devastating to the NU system. And yet this bill, which has a fiscal note of zero, I would point out, does create costs to the university. While these committee members might not be reimbursed for their time on the committee, committees cost money. <laughs> they incur expenses. And the bill itself does prescribe for their, re their expenses to be reimbursed when they are actual and tangible. So one would presume if that required any um, justice researching or any police <coughs> investigation researching, those reports cost money to be pulled. Um, any kind of um, consultation with outside experts or anything like that is going to cost money to the committee. And the other thing that really, really bothers me about this Committee for Free Expression is that in AM 1553, which is the only amendment that I have access to at this time, it calls for this committee to produce a publicly available report. Now, as we know from testimony and what we've seen recently regarding this August event, when someone is outed publicly and these disciplinary procedures are put into the public's view, death threats happen. Really ugly things get said about people. And to be honest, although a lot of really ugly and scary things were said about the um, graduate student, pretty ugly things were said about the student who reacted at her turning point booth as well. And I think that if we make publicly available records that are searchable and, and everybody can find of disciplinary procedures, which is kind of a violation of employment law as it is because disciplinary procedures are, are confidential, we're really putting a lot of 
faculty and employees and, and at some point even students that are involved in these incidents in danger by making this kind Thank of information you. publicly available. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Hello. My name is Anthony Schutz, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y, S-C-H-U-T-Z. I teach at the law school. I've been there since about 2006. I teach agricultural law, water law, state and local government, and I have a book on the state constitution. So I'm sort of a state constitution expert, I guess, if there is one. And so what I'm here today to talk, talk about is really accent and more generally the separation of powers between the legislature and the Board of Regents. And I've got two main points that I'll make, and I discuss them in more detail in a paper because when law professors speak, they speak, right? Uh, so I've got a longer explanation of what it is that I want to talk about, but I've got two main points that I want to talk about today. First is uh, really sort of an explanation of why the Board of Regents as an autonomous university governance mechanism is a good thing, right? And I think there's three primary justifications for it. First, historical, second, practical, and third, theoretical. Historically speaking, we've had a Board of Regents that's elected for over 140 years. It was in the 1860, uh, I'm sorry, it was in the 1875 Constitution, proposed originally in the 1871 Constitution. It's been there ever since. Uh, there have been proposals to change it over time. We've rejected those proposals, not at the polls, but there's been revision commissions that have proposed them and we haven't forwarded them to the voters. It seems to be a firm piece of our state constitution. State constitution writing in the late 1800s and early 1900s was very concerned with distributing power across different parts of government. That's why we have an elected state treasurer. That's why we have an elected attorney general. That's why we have an elected secretary of state. It's why our governor wields relatively little authority within the executive branch because we wanted to fragment authority as much as we could. And we did that with the Board of Regents as well. And so what the court is left to do in cases that involve the legislature and the Board of Regents is try to sort of police the boundary between the two. Um, and that's basically what we have as a historical matter. As a practical matter, it makes sense to have a university with an elected board of regents that's specifically designed to deal with the problems that they have. It's the only issue they have to deal with is the university. Uh, so for example, if I had 15,000 employees and 55,000 students, a $940 million budget, and I am basically concerning myself with every aspect of humankind, including perhaps um, our origins, I would want an expert body dealing with the speech the issues that ensue. And Professor Berger talked about how complicated that doctrine becomes just on its own. Imagine deploying that in that setting. Right? And that's why I think a Board of Regents is a good idea just practically speaking. Theoretically, it also makes some sense from a governmental design perspective. I think it makes it's pretty ingenious, really. You don't have to worry yourselves with the free speech issues that arise on campus. Those are Schaefer's problem. Right? <laughs> Schaefer's going to stand to get elected this next time and he's going to have to answer to his constituency. You won't have to. This is also a good thing for the constituency. When I go to vote on my senator, I may agree with my senator's property tax stance. I may agree with his stance on water augmentation projects, for example. But I may vehemently disagree with his stance on the university's speech issue. What do I do? I just have one choice to make over a multifaceted performance. When we separate out the sphere of authority related to the university and place it in the hands of someone else, now my choice with regard to the university is confined to the university. I can like or dislike what Schaefer decides to do, and I can visit my political preferences on my senator based upon what they did. So it's actually a good thing, right, to separate these spheres of authority. Political accountability is maintained through that sort of autonomy in those separate spheres of authority. The point, you don't have to do it, right? It's not your job and that's a good thing, right? Because it's Schaefer's job and Schaefer is elected. And Schaefer will be subject to the ire of the electorate in the event he gets it wrong. So with that, um, I'll leave you with those sorts of thoughts on why the Board of Regents is a separate autonomous body is a, is a good thing. I could talk about the standards that courts use to divide up power and their relationship to X and if you want, um, but I'll be here to 
answer questions. Thank you. Any questions? Senator Lanahan. Thank you, Chairman Groming. I am not a lawyer. I'm lucky enough to have two daughters that have attended UNL. One's still there, so she's probably watching in horror right now. <laughs> but uh, somebody who is a lawyer and graduated from UNL this morning pointed out to me that in our Constitution it says the legislature is the supreme law. What, what does it? Mm, it doesn't say that. Okay, what does it say? Well, it says, in, it says a lot of things. Our Constitution is about 35,000 words long. The federal constitution is about 7,000 words long. So we tend toward detail in our constitution. We, do. we have a general provision on the separation of powers, and it says that unless otherwise prescribed in the constitution, there's a legislative branch, a judicial branch, and an, ex and an executive branch, right? Okay. We do, though, have these other provisions that provide for different sorts of authority. So the provision on the Board of Regents provides... What is the, my question is, what does it say the legislature authority is? It doesn't. That's the problem, right? That's the difficulty that courts encounter. It's not entirely clear what the legislative authority is, just like it's not entirely clear what the judicial authority is or what the executive authority is. In the main, it's somewhat easy to figure it out. The legislature's authority is to make laws, right? Mm -hmm. Unless as otherwise provided in the Constitution. And the Constitution provides that the Board of Regents shall be vested with the general governing authority over the university. Okay. So the and question becomes lawyer, how do those and, two. And I, we've heard quite convincingly and for a few couple hours here sure. what the Board of Regents' yeah. job is. But I'm asking you what our job is. Exactly. Your job is to leave the Board of Regents alone that's to a large extent. Because that right. says that in the Constitution. That's what Exxon says. Okay, but right? that's not the Constitution. No, that's true. That's true. But the judiciary's job, right, a constitutionally de delegated job for it, is to say what the law is with regard to what the words in the Maybe Constitution mean. Maybe there's a lawyer on the panel that can do this much There might be one of those. Me. But I, I, I don't want to make light of it, though, because the question is a good one. What is the relationship between the legislature and the Board of Regents? I'm not... No, I'm not talking about the Board of Regents. Yes. The, the legislature's authority is limited insofar as its impact on the Board of Regents is concerned. But what is our, do, are we not charged? I mean, you said something else about, you know, that it, I, when I go to vote for my senator, I yeah. want to know his position on property taxes. Sure. We don't collect property taxes in the state of Nebraska. No, I know. That's actually, it's not the greatest example, is it? Because no, those are kind of a local issue and but we should maybe very, stay out of it. But that's a different committee, I think. <laughs> but it's and very, I think it's probably a different issue. Excuse me. It's very appropriate that you would say that because most of the people that vote for us do. They do. Look to us for leadership on all these issues. Yes. And sometimes we abstain from the, sometimes the legislature abstains on grounds of like, local control or something along those lines, right? Sometimes it's constitutionally bound to abstain from certain issues, and that's all that I'm arguing here. Okay, thank you. The relationship, though, between the scope, I should put it this way, the scope of the Board of Regents' authority. That's been made abundantly clear today. Okay. Their scope. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Any other questions? Senator Moorfield. Thank you, Senator Groney. Professor Schutz, thank you for coming. It seems like all of my professors have come today. Um, we didn't have Rick, but we yeah, talked yeah. about him. And thanks so thanks much. Thanks actually for being really flexible when I was in your state and local government class, for allowing me to come to legislative bodies like this That's and right. testify, That's right. even though it was during the class time. Um, <laughs> Dean, <laughs> Dean Moberly doesn't need to hear that. But um, in any case, I mean, so I think the point that um, Senator Lanahan was getting to, and I was looking up the specific. Uh, part of the Constitution mm -hmm. is the fact that the legislature, the legislative authority of the state shall be vested in a legislature consisting of one chamber, mm -hmm. um, and then it goes on to talk about um, some of our powers to create laws. Mm -hmm. I guess, <clears throat> on one hand, I understand, you, you make a very convincing argument about the need to um, keep the Board of Regents independent and create um, create their own policies that are unique to the university system. And I think that I think that the, the issue that I've been hearing from a lot of senators on the floor and in this committee is a lot of people have a hard time disconnecting, a lot of people as in state senators, have a hard time disconnecting the fact that we provide for the budget. Mm -hmm. which allows for the university to exist in many cases. Mm -hmm. But we cannot set some of the general policies of the university. Now, mm -hmm. 
I'm personally, for public record, in the camp of we need to leave the university alone. And sometimes I introduce bills that I know uh, maybe they're constitutionally suspect, but it pushes the university to relook at an issue like sexual assault mm -hmm. or something like that. But I think that that's the disconnect right now, and that's the thing that is being debated quietly among the body before we see a sure. bill like this. The extent to which you can tie strings to funding is a, is a common issue when we're talking about vertical separations of power, right? So to what extent can the federal government put strings on its spending authority? It's been litigated, right? There's a lots, of, lots of case law out there on that. We don't have a lot of it on the relationship between the legislature and the Board of Regents. If we agree that it's a semi-autonomous or largely autonomous, politically accountable elected body, but it nonetheless relies on the legislature for an appropriation, not with regard to its own funds, but with regard to public funds, the question becomes how much can we tie to that, right? How many strings can you attach to it? We haven't litigated that issue. But if it's tied to spending, there's a greater chance that it'll be acceptable to the court. If it's not tied to spending, it's very difficult to try to argue that what you have is binding on the Board of Regents. This is actually such a good question that, or, or such a, I don't know, such a <laughs> difficult issue that the legislature at different times has asked the Attorney General for its opinion. One of the matters, for example, that we've asked the Attorney General for their opinion on is the extent to which the legislature can write a law that requires all university employees to use the same credit card. Right? Can that apply to university personnel? And that was a question that is so uncertain that we sent it to the Attorney General's office. Right? That's how much trepidation we have with this relationship between the legislature and the Attorney General's office. The Attorney General's office responded, maybe. Right? <laughs> we think He's maybe. Also elected. Yeah, we think maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's true, right? And by design. So yeah, it's a difficult question. If you tie it to funding, it's more likely to be okay. But again, it could be an overreach. We need some case law on that. If it's not tied to funding, it's much more difficult. And then there's the constitutional text, which isn't entirely clear at all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I have to mention that Dean Moberly is awesome, because that seems to be a, a general theme, and I work for him. So. <laughs> Sir, uh, but the state constitution, we're, we're unique with the people have a lot to say. The first power is the, le is the people, according to our Constitution. The second is the legislature. It is, and we reflect, so it, go ahead, I'm sorry. So the people could get in an uproar right now about this and have a constitutional amendment and change section, whichever it is. Indeed. And, and in fact, we have responded to Exxon in the past. Um, Article 7, Section 14 provides for a coordinating commission on post-secondary education. The reason why we had to adopt that was because of Exxon and Article 7, Section 10, which is what Exxon interprets. The Coordinating Commission on Post-Secondary Education provides a review mechanism for university decisions on like buildings and things along those lines. It also helps us coordinate what the university does with what the community colleges do and what the state colleges do. Legislation couldn't do that because of Article 7, Section 10. So we went back to the drawing board and we said, okay, we want some coordination across these bodies, and we amended the Constitution to make it happen. But Does that make sense? They reacted to Exxon, but the, they could have went the other way, and they could have negated Exxon by changing they could the have. language, existing language. Is in in fact, we, we could have amended, yes. we could have eliminated Article 7, Section 10 altogether and treated them like state colleges. Yes. So, yeah. But we haven't. But it's not sacrosanct to state constitution. No, People no. People change it all the time. Not at all. We do change it all and the time. And that's a concern. This whole function, what we've done here, has been a, a, a practice in free speech. Exactly. Where the people have raised their head. It isn't just Senator Halloran. It's a lot of folks and the, the, the citizens out there that are concerned about the direction of the university and its instructional staff. Indeed. It's just it's not three senators. No. Uh, 1974, I had an English instructor named David Hilger. He got fired for free speech, Hil Hibbler. Uh, in the 1990s, and let me tell you about a farm kid coming out of the Bohemian Alps, and that guy teaching me <laughs> and telling me about against the anti-Vietnam War when my brother was over there. That was offensive. He lost that debate with me. Sure. 
So anyway, I understand free speech, but, but I also understand the state constitution. Mm -hmm. But it can be changed. It can, sure. And the legislature has the authority. We create the NRDs. We create a lot of things in this state, mm -hmm. the legislature does. Yeah. And it can address the statute here. I mean, the Exxon case. The trial court further, by the opinion by Basha, Bosch law. The trial court further found that the provision that the duties and powers of the Board of Regents shall be prescribed by law means that the legislature may set forth the powers and duties of the regents. Mm -hmm. But then if you look at the result in the case, they made exceptions to about six different laws that were generally applicable and couldn't apply to the university as a result. So it, it, Exxon is, some of the language does support the notion that the, that the legislature... Defense, what side of the fence you're on? Well, yeah, I, I mean, we do have to follow the case until it's overruled, or at least that's my position. I'll pass uh, law until it's overruled. That's I true, mean, that's I'm true. And, and you are right about, about the, the people's reservation of power. In fact, the people can amend the Constitution directly through the ballot initiative process and all of that. And so if they're unhappy with the way in which the regents are proceeding, they have a lot of different choices. One, they can go vote in their region election. Two, they could change the Constitution Thank to you. put the Board of Regents under the auspices of the legislature. But they haven't yet chosen to do that. And our Constitution drafters 140 years ago said, we don't want them under the auspices of the legislature. We want them to be but politically accountable. But in the state of Nebraska, our Constitution is truly fluid because the, the people it have is. a big part in it. It is. And, and many state constitutions are that way. They're very often uh, not amended. Not a lot have the power of the initiative as we do. That's true. The direct democracy provisions are somewhat unique to us. Yes. Yeah. I'd love to hear your views on water augmentation. If you're on the right side of the thing, I'd love you they to They might be able to sell bill. that land. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, Senator. You. How many more? Three? I'll shut up. No. My name is Dr. Stephen Ramsey. My name is spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N-R-A-M-S-A-Y, and I am Susan J. Rosowski, Associate University Professor of English at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I mentioned my title. Uh, this evening only to provide some context for my remarks. I'm not representing the University of Nebraska or any of its subunits today. But I am here to speak in strong opposition to LB 718. I believe first that much of what this bill proposes is illegal under the Nebraska State Constitution and that those parts of the bill that are not are nonetheless redundant with respect to the United States Constitution. If this bill were to become law, I seriously doubt that it could withstand the most rudimentary legal challenge. But I am a professional educator, not a lawyer, and my main message for the committee today is this. Political interference by the state government in the operation of the state's colleges and universities is a dangerous proposition. One of the many reasons American colleges and universities are the envy of the world is because political interference in higher education has generally not been part of our political tradition. In this country, the term state university means funded by the state, sponsored by the state. This is not the case in much of the rest of the world where state university means controlled by the state. A public system of higher education that is not subject to governmental interference is, I believe, one of the proudest achievements of American democracy. This bill openly and drastically violates that tradition. And let us be clear. This bill is not a harmless ceremonial celebration of the First Amendment. It establishes as a matter of state law a standing committee at the university that reports directly to the legislature. It even specifies the composition of that committee. No other body at the University of Nebraska, for example, including the Board of Regents itself, operates in this way. What's more, I believe this bill would have the opposite of its intended effect. While seeming to strengthen free speech protections, it will nonetheless have a chilling effect on free speech at our state colleges and universities. Faculty and students will both be left to wonder whether speech otherwise protected under the First Amendment and backed by over 200 years of First Amendment jurisprudence will nonetheless fail to meet some mysterious additional standards set by the state legislature. I believe this bill represents an attempt to reframe rights broadly guaranteed by the US Constitution in terms of narrow, transient political interests. This is a very slippery slope, 
that we approach at our extreme peril. I strongly encourage the committee to vote against this bill. Thank you. Question? What is your opinion of the Board of Regents commitment to free expression? Uh, you know, I, I think that, um, I mean, I, I, have some, I have some quibbles with it. What I do not doubt is, is the, the Board of Regents uh, uh, commitment to free speech. And I, and I actually, uh, you know, what's, what's more important to me is that the Board of Regents respect that universities are, are, are dynamic environments largely devoted to debating subjects precisely like that. And they are the competent authority to judge these matters. So when they say guide, for facilities, use plans, university resources, for example, its land and buildings, library collection, its computer <coughs> networks are to be applied first and foremost to the mission of teaching, research, and public service. Would you believe some of the stuff that was on the English department's uh, as a mission statement would could be suspect under that new directive about? What are you referring to specifically? The computer networks. No, I mean, what did the mission statement well, refer to? Well, I didn't read it. Just what I've seen about, uh, uh, I guess it was emailed to me. I'm sorry, did you just say that you did not read the mission statement? I did read it. I, okay. Somebody did email it to me, uh, a link, uh, about, it, was, it went into a bunch of uh, social issues instead of, uh, instead of anything about the mission about learning, uh, expansion, uh, a wide liberal arts, in literature, it went into a bunch of social issues. I, I, I actually, I, I, I have been teaching the subject of English literature for over 20 years. I find it, I find it impossible to discuss the subject without touching on what you are referring to as social issues. I don't know how you study literature in the absence of human culture and its issues and justice and social, and so forth. I, I don't know what that is. They don't know what that would look like. Tied together. Uh, yes, they are tied together. In the study of human culture, yes. No question we'll, we'll about it, and I don't. And I don't know any. I don't know anyone in my entire profession who would disagree with that statement. I know a lot who would. Not, not English professors, you don't. What's that? Not English professors, you don't. That's fine, but you work there. The people own it. The university. I forgive me. People do what? Own the university. It's part of the people's property. The university. The yes, it is indeed. Class. Yes, it is indeed. Yes, it you. is indeed, and it's in, and it, 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 which uh, bears directly on my point of why, why it it, it amounts to uh, you know it, again is it you know political interference in the work of the university is it is a is a or l let's say lack of political interference in the work of the university I I really think is is honestly one of the things we can most be proud of in this country because uh, and I'll, I'll tell you something else I, I get email all the time from people in Afghanistan and Iran and Syria and Iraq all the time for as long as I've been teaching and one of the reasons they want to come here is because in those places they don't have what we're contemplating doing here they don't they don't have that what state universities in those places I means controlled by the state uh, that we don't have that here and it, I, I don't know why we want to start it's something that seems to me we can be very very proud of don't infer I, I, what position I take on this bill by my questioning I like to play the devil's advocate uh, it needs to be it's called free speech and, and the exchange of ideals so thank you for your testimony anybody else Everyone. Um, I'm Ayat, first name A-Y-A-T, last name Maribi, A-R-I-B-I, and I'm different than everybody else who is speaking today because everything that everyone is talking about actually affects my day-to-day -day life and the quality of my education because I'm a junior at, a junior at the university. Um, I also serve on the Student Code of Conduct. I was the chair of the Diversity Inclusion Committee through uh, student government when we had the Black Lives Matter rally and we, when we had the issue um, with the three football players who knelt, and I currently serve as the external vice president of student government, and I deal with all the diversity issues and I get all the text messages and the emails from students concerned about um, what's on the table today um, so 
I have heard so many stories from students on campus that say they are uncomfortable and it is from the left and it's the right, um, but I'm a business student and we say the numbers don't lie and the numbers from what I've collected, but take that with a grain of salt, isn't really coming from um, the right side of the spectrum and I've heard so many stories from students but nothing has been done about the intimidation that we receive on campus. I haven't had any state senators come and talk to me about writing a bill in support of um, the discrimination that the three football players received last year where they received death threats and threats of lynching, um, especially considering this senator is such um, is so adamant about free speech and protecting everyone on campus. Um, but we were just told to suck it up and just move on with our lives. But um, my concern is we see this nationwide uh, trend behind the popular notion within conservative circles that universities have a liberal bias. Consistently, these students will leave higher education because they perceive critical thinking, self-critique, and open discussion as a tax on their selfhood rather than as a process of refining ideas and arguments. All of their accusations about how people who disagree with them are just too sensitive are nothing more than just projection because the very idea that they should question their own assumptions is something they believe would make them weak. Um, our Constitution already defines free speech as everybody here who has degrees already mentioned um, and I think it's unnecessary for the state to try to meddle in something that um, I feel like we already have what we need in regards to that subject. Um, I just want you all to think when it comes time for voting for this why this was brought to the table. I personally do believe it was because of the incident that happened and I was also present at that incident and to me it just seems very politically um, motivated and very inappropriate and I'm very opposed to this because I feel like enforcing freedom of speech um, is a contradiction in terms of, of language and rhetoric as well. And I'll take any questions if you have any. Questions? So are you okay with the Board of Regents committed, commitment to free expression? Do you think that helps the students better understand what rights they have? And I was actually involved in the writing of that um, document and we spoke with lots of people. So. I feel like there's this issue with politics where people assume they know what's best without actually addressing the people that it affects. So we spoke with different groups of students and we spoke with different kinds of faculty and staff and we had the Board of Regents and other professors and administrators who were involved in the writing of this document that really tried to um, make um, a piece of literature that would have kind of applied to as general of a student body as possible. Um, whereas like the bill that's on the table today just seems like I mentioned earlier, very politically mandated. This university one has a lot of dictates in it too and descriptions of what free speech is and where and how, but you have no problem with that. All I can say is um, obviously they didn't take me as seriously as maybe like other professors or something because I'm just 21 I don't even have a degree. Um, but I think that you, you just have to work from inside the system, so I would prefer that um, to the bill that's on the table, um, just because I believe that it is, um, it can be more generally ap applied to the student body and to the staff and administration than what is on the table today. But you're not implying that free speech can be defined within a subset of, in, of citizens, that all of a sudden you got a subset here at this campus and they can define what free speech is. You're not trying saying that, are you? I think free speech is a very subjective matter and I don't know if I'm um, credible enough to, de to define what it is, um, but just as a student, like as a student that's even faced discrimination on our campus and has spoken with administrators and no one like really was very participatory in the conversation about this, um, it doesn't make sense to all of a sudden try to bring this um, very biased document about free speech when so many other um, incidents of free speech has hap have happened and no one cared about our free speech. Somebody said something that you disagreed with to you. That's free speech, isn't it? Um, I think there's Did a divide between free speech and hate speech. Um, for instance, uh, I'm involved, like I said, in student government and two years ago we had a senator um, and we're all elected just like how y'all are. He just stood up on a stage and said the n-word multiple times, which is not the issue. But then we also had multiple fake accounts, um, even like Twitter, Facebook, Yik Yak, the etc., that called for like lynching of black students on our campus. And whether it's like just a joke or whatever it is, this is a serious threat. And um, I am disappointed that some administration didn't take it seriously. But I feel like if this was really about free speech and the protection of students on campus, um, 
something would have been done about physical threats to people's lives beforehand, before today. What should be done? I don't have the answer for that. Um, I should just they feel be like silenced, or should they not silenced, but I think charged with a crime. I don't think that's, in my opinion, I don't think that's what should be done. I think what needs to be ha to happen is everyone feels it's very impolite to discuss these things. It's impolite to discuss racism and discrimination and the history of, of who we are as Americans. I think what needs to be done is a commit, like the university to commit to what they're supposed to do, which is teach to have a required race and ethnicities class or even just like a civil discourse class. Because that student, the conservative student, like her, her feelings of being upset are definitely true, and I'm upset that she felt that way, and I was present that day. But it's just, she did not want to speak with other people, other people not want to speak with her. We need to teach people how to be um, civil in these situations and learn to, like the senator was speaking about earlier, you can be friends with someone that you have a different opinion with and go out with afterwards and try to make that relationship so you no longer have but these really strong biases. you also have a right not to be friendly, do you not? That's part of free speech. We don't need to force people to do that, but in the same way our university dictates that, for instance, an English major needs to take a Chem 109 course to learn about scientific reasoning, we could also dictate that um, all students are required to learn about the history of the actual history of the US and not wash that out to, to what we're taught these days and about having civil discourse so I'm not going to force you to have a conversation with me but I think institutions of higher education should be should commit to teaching these students which are the leaders of the future and the people who are gonna the yeah. professionals of the future how to have conversations not even friendship just conversations with people that are different than who they are thank you any other questions Thank you for your time. One left. Good evening, Senator Grody, member of the Education Committee. My name is Larry Shear, L-A-R-R-Y-S-C-H-E-R-E-R, -R -E -R, and I'm here representing the Nebraska State Education Association opposing LB 718. Specifically, my comments, I'm going to restrict them to our faculty at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. Sent this bill out to them as a matter of uh, information, asking them if they had an opinion on it, and, and their major concern was the creation of the uh, Committee on Free Speech and the duplication of effort. Uh, you know, basic, basically they said the university is already has a number of policies on this. They're not concerned with it. It isn't a problem at Kearney. University of Nebraska at Kearney is, is not really a, a uh, hotbed of liberalism or radicalism. It's, it's in the center of Nebraska, fairly practical people. Their practical concern was if we're going to direct the university to create another layer of governance that might be punitive to them, it might result in them losing their jobs, might take away from the mission of the university uh, and, and their future, their employment. So that's, that's the point I want to make. Uh, I rarely get a chance to disagree with a law professor, but uh, <laughs> Professor Stutt said that this, the uh, state college system does not have the same uh, governance protection. It does have the same, and so they would have the same constitutional argument, I would, I would guess, <coughs> as a Board of Regents. Community colleges, which I understand the amendment would apply to as well, that's more a question of local control. There's, there's a huge difference between the Metro Community College and the Western Nebraska Community College in, in terms of the culture, in terms of what uh, f people feel comfortable doing. And it really, uh, you know, it hasn't been a big issue there. Uh, don't doubt that there are some students that are offended by things other students or their faculty say, uh, but it hasn't been a real issue. So to sum it up, uh, our faculty at UNK are concerned about creating this new committee. They don't think it's necessary. They think it's redundant. So I'll stop there. Any questions? You, you're fine with the University of Nebraska, the Regents policy? I thought it was very good, yes. You are? Yes, I, and I think that the issue, they, they left the, the question of what is a, a, a free speech zone at Kearney to be different from UNL, to be different from UNO. I th you know, in my opinion, that's, that's allowing the local governance at those campuses to make those decisions, which I think it should be. And our, our faculty are generally comfortable with that. You started your comments that Kearney isn't a bastion of liberalism. <laughs> but wouldn't Compared this, to Lincoln. This policy is, has no, no bias. 
No, no I mean, it, it doesn't. University policy it has doesn't. No bias, I, I, so yeah. in Carney, it would protect the young individual who yeah. has a different, completely different view. Yeah, it'd more it likely protect a liberal up, student in, in Carney. Might I would have say. a table up with a sure. very liberal. Sure. I mean, yeah. this is not a conservative or liberal. I uh, to totally agree. You know, I, I just saying that this is not coming from a, a political bent out there. It protects all. It protects all. They're concerned about creating another layer of governance, a watchdog ent entity that might be punitive, in their opinion. Thank you. Any thank you. Other questions, Senator Brooks. Yeah, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, I agree that the the chances of a punitive body somewhere to like a star chamber or something. I mean, that's my vision of what what the extreme case of what this could be is. And uh, I appreciate your coming forward and. Yeah, is that when I read the rest of the, the, the bill, it was just free First Amendment type principles that uh, they were putting into a statute. And uh, it's the enforcement of it and accountability, uh, whatever you want to call it, that was worrisome to our faculty. Thank you. Any other yeah. questions? Thank you. Um, we had, is there any other opposition? One more? Or anybody else? Neutral. Neutral. I'll remember neutral. Thank you. Go ahead, anytime. My name is April Jorgensen, A P R I L J O R G E N S E N. I'm here speaking as an individual. As the capital inscription reads, the salvation of the state is watchfulness of the citizen, and we're paying attention. And in the interest of watchfulness, I just want to note on the record that the people presenting this bill were also helped to their office by large donations by billionaire Governor Ricketts. In fact, according to Data Omaha, the governor paid for nearly 24% of Senator Halloran's election campaign. I feel that this information should be considered as you determine the true intent behind this bill and whether this is just doing the governor's bidding. I would hate to see a governor create a billionaire oligarchy to undermine the democracy of our state by crushing dissent. I urge you not to advance this bill. Thank you. Any questions, Senator Erdman? Thank you, Senator Tony. Do you know how much the governor gave me? Zero dollars. Huh? Zero dollars, I believe. That's it? Yeah. So don't classify me in that group. Apologize. I meant Erdman. Okay. I mean, Halloran and Bruce. <laughs> for... I didn't get any money either. <laughs> uh, so anyway. <laughs> me neither. I'm sorry, okay, that's <laughs> me. <laughs> so thank you. I, your testimony was good. Thank you. You exercised your free speech as a citizen. That's very important. Uh, the opposition letters. We received three. Nebraska Community College Association, Nebraska State College Systems, and Carmen Smith from Lincoln. Uh, opposition is 718. Neutral. My name is David Moshman, D-A-V-I-D-M-O-S-H-M-A-N. I'm a professor emeritus of educational psychology at UNL, and I'm speaking as president of the Academic Freedom Coalition of Nebraska, AFCON, which supports intellectual freedom for students and teachers and researchers in Nebraska schools, colleges, and libraries. We fully support the intent of this bill and most of its provisions, but also have some serious concerns. Uh, over the past 30 years, public colleges across the United States have instituted unconstitutional policies authorizing punishment of broad categories of objectionable speech. UNL's Student Code of Conduct, for example, prohibits, quote, verbal abuse, end quote, and endangering the, quote, reputation of any person, end quote. In 2014 and 2015, UNL received letters from the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, FIRE, noting that such language, which can be found in multiple UNL policies, threatens a great deal of speech protected by the First Amendment. Free expression issues in Nebraska higher education are by no means limited to UNL. AFCON has addressed free expression issues at Peru State, Wayne State, and Shadron State, including serious matters in the past few years. We have reason to believe that the state of free expression in the state college system is worse than within the University of Nebraska, in part because it's easier to keep problems hidden. 
There is thus much need for a law like this one that would require all public educational institutions to adhere to strong standards of free expression and to be transparent about their policies and practices in this regard. We have two general concerns about the bill in its current form, however. First, we're concerned about micromanagement, especially with regard to the mandate requiring each institution to set up a permanent committee on free speech and dictating its structure and operations in detail. Based on our experience, we believe most institutions should indeed set up a committee something like what this bill proposes. The present bill goes much too far, however, in dictating the permanent structure and operations of these committees. Second, this bill focuses on free speech outside the core academic environment. It's important to be clear that the bill is not intended to address the academic freedoms of faculty and students in teaching, learning, and inquiry. We suggest amending the bill to require every institution to, one, have an academic freedom policy protecting and promoting the intellectual freedom of students and faculty in curricular and research contexts, and two, reference its academic freedom policy in its free expression policy. Uh, in closing, I want to emphasize how pleased we would be to see a properly amended version of this bill become law. And I understand that FIRE has been working with Senator Halloran today, and there is a revised version in, in progress. Many of the present provisions would greatly aid AFCON's efforts to promote intellectual freedom in education, which ultimately benefits us all. Thank you. Any questions? somebody who sat there through all this to the last, you deserve at least one question. What was your group again? The Academic Freedom Coalition of Nebraska. Is that, is that a, uh, affiliate of a national? There's no national. We're a unique Nebraska organization. We were founded almost exactly 30 years ago in February 1988, initially concerned with intellectual freedom issues of students and faculty in secondary education, uh, but we're a coalition of a variety of organizations, including higher education, and we support intellectual freedom for students and faculty uh, at all educational so institutions. So in the high schools? Yes. Uh, hopefully someday I can yell at the ref again without getting thrown out of the gym. <laughs> I've got a bill for that. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> I want my free speech back. Thank you. Uh, Senator Halloran. Uh, neutral. He was neutral. Any other neutral? Sorry. I asked. You must have missed it, Spike. Mr. Eichel. I know. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman Growing and members of the Education Committee. My name is Spike Eichel, S-P-I-K-E, last name is E-I-C-K-H-O-L-T, appearing on behalf of the ACLU of Nebraska in a neutral capacity. You're um, going to receive a copy of our statement along with our free speech policy and some uh, the national ACLU free speech <laughs> policy uh, position. I'm not going to restate those or read from the letter. I'll just try to summarize. I know that you've been here for quite a long time. We are in a neutral capacity. We do support, really, the spirit and the intent of much of this bill. And I'm speaking, actually, to the rewrite, the AM 1553 to the replacement amendment that Senator Halloran filed after introducing LD 718. We do support sort of the spirit and the intent of the bill. And really, some of the provisions of AM 1553, we really would, uh, and we do point out, are really very good. For instance, uh, Section 5 of the bill, it does provide for notice so students know what the free speech policy is on campus and the sanctions. I think that's good. That provides for some due process. Section 3, uh, subsection 1 and subsection 2 are really strong commitments to academic freedom that we ask the committee to also consider and at least note. And then subsection, uh, or section 3, subsection 7, the delegation or clarification of traditional public forum. Um, and that would be the public areas on campus. We do disagree with the University Board of Regents policy on that. You heard from the council earlier where he tried to argue, or did argue that the university, the public area in the university is not a traditional public forum. We disagree with that. When Danielle Conrad testified on January 25th, we urged the Board of Regents to change that distinction or, or characterization. I think that it is a traditional public forum. I think you've got 40 or 50 years of protests happening on campus that is similar to a street corner, a park. You had it just recently with the Women's March. That was a non-student, or at least some non-students, starting at the university on clearly a political thing, beginning at the university and continuing to the Capitol. But the reason that we're neutral, I think, ultimately, and you've talked about it really all afternoon and in the evening, is that no matter really what this committee tries to do, what the body tries to do, you run into the problem in Exxon. And we read Exxon 
really the way the university does too, and that is Article 7, Section 10 does provide that the Board of Regents has the general governance of the university. The Board of Regents has that power. And if you look at, if you look at the Exxon case, the legislature passed a series of laws that provided for a variety of different things regarding the management of the university. Everything from <coughs> the, reception, the the university receiving certain gifts over a dollar amount, personnel decisions, the construction of new facilities, and the court simply said the legislature can't do that. The only way you really make a meaningful free speech policy is to have some sort of sanction, some sort of remedy, some sort of process the legislature do that, and it's our position that Exxon just prohibits the, the body from doing that. So. It's a very good expression of, of some First Amendment rights and things that are important to us. I think we had a good debate today about this, or at least the committee has. But ultimately, I think the Board of Regents is their decision. I agree with Professor Schatz. Thank you. Any questions? What's your opinion of the universities? One point that we did disagree upon was that their characterization or distinction that the public areas, the plazas, the parks, or the green space, if you will, the sidewalks, are not traditional public forum that they can somehow limit non-students, or maybe even students, from using that for traditional speech. We disagree with that. I think it's, we think that's too overbroad. And when we testified before the Board of Regents, we made some suggestions that they did not adopt. This is an example. So is there, except, is there a difference between a publicly owned university by the people who are funded uh, by the people versus a Harvard or a Yale about a public area? Well, there is. I mean, for the First Amendment to apply, you have to have state action. You have to have the government either providing or limiting someone from doing something. So you can't go into a private business or you can't go into someone's home and think you have a right to protest. But when you're talking about traditional public forums, the perfect example is the street corner or the public park where anyone can go there really any time and talk about stuff. The general counsel who testified before made the argument that the university is not a traditional public forum. I, I think that's too broad. I think that there, I think you have traditionally, at least the last 40 or 50 years, people protesting on campus. So what you're saying, I'm not a lawyer, but you, mm -hmm. it's basically by repetitive action of the university that's became common law. It's became traditional. Common right. law is traditional, right? right? And so to deny one and allow, uh, look the other way for another, like the Women's March, right? or, and then to deny, um, I'm not going to say anything because right. you'll say it's B, but a different group would be question. questionable. Yeah, you're right. That's right. I mean, they don't have to provide it for everyone. They, they have to be subject neutral, at least viewpoint neutral, perhaps content neutral as well, depending on other time, place, and manner restrictions that they can't do. I mean, in the middle of the night, they can't be disturbing classes, that kind of thing. So if we, if they pass the law, the legislature did set a general direction that free speech commonly held on any public entity or whatever, it must be also followed by the University of Nebraska. I could try. Um, oh, that would somehow general. survive Exxon, you mean? Yeah. Something like that? I mean, if you look at No, Exxon not get around decision. Exxon, but just oh, to say a general on the free speech issue. I could. I think if it's going to be so general, it's really just going to be an expression of a like. It's just going to be a general approval. And I don't really know if you put that in a statute to have any kind of actual meaning. Just curious. Almost Thank like you. a resolution there. Any questions besides me? Thank you. Any other neutral testimony? We've had no letters, neutral <coughs> letters. Uh, Senator Halloran? I want to exercise your free speech in closing. Let's see everybody get comfortable. <laughs> Please don't take off your coat. Two minutes. <laughs> Turn the red light on. <laughs> Two minutes is board approved. Coat off. Holy moly. Excuse me. Well, I would like to uh, uh, express my gratitude for everyone who testified today and expressing. Uh, their freedom of speech and uh, ability to express themselves. Um, and I would look upon the grace, grace of the committee uh, to give me time to, which won't take much time, but before you exact, to implement uh, what FIRE proposed into this, the body of this uh, legislation. And, and in summary, what that will do is it will take away all this onerous uh, issue of us managing what those policies specifically are 
and we'll give them, each institution, the opportunity to uh, define those, which, in effect, they have here, all right? And uh, it will also, uh, uh, we, will prob we will also look at minimizing what we have for the definition of what the committee is. Just leave it up to the institution. Institutions, God bless them, are very good at forming committees. They'll do it anyway. So we don't have to define that for them. I have all the faith in the world. They will form a committee to do that. But uh, that's what I would like to do with the grace of the committee to allow me to do that, uh, implement FIRE's recommendation. Um, and I think ultimately, uh, ultimately it's important for, for us to address this in some fashion uh, because the University of Missouri did not um, quickly address it. And um, I, I'm not saying that will happen here, but the University of Missouri had an issue with the drop in, in, uh, in people uh, applying to go to school there, 35%. And a lot of it was because the universities neglected, or the legislature, whichever the case might be, neglected to address the issue and, and address it quickly. And so uh, with that, uh, I will close and put my jacket back on. Question? Question. Um, correct me if I'm oh, wrong. May I make didn't, one more comment, Mr. Uni may I make ahead. one quick yes. comment? Uh, several weeks ago, or a week or so ago, well, it was in the interim just between last Thursday, I guess, because that's when the final, I had, I had a draft of the university's proposal, but not a final until Thursday. But about a week ago, I had, I had uh, several regents approach me and say, Senator Heller, and why don't you uh, uh, why don't you withdraw your bill? Because the policies that we've uh, formulated are very parallel with what you're having in your bill, and I I find that a little bit odd that there was so much angst about those specific policy issues that we were proposing in this bill, and yet a couple of regions said they're just very parallel. Uh, we have no problem with them. It just, I guess, depends on who the author is. But at any rate, but you all, my second close. But you do have a the committee in there, the enforcement at the back end that the university doesn't have. Is that not true? Well, there will be. We will have expectations that that the university form a committee to deal with it, but we're not going to define how that committee's made up. And Did not the Missouri delayed fire an individual who uh, limited free speech? Correct, yeah. And yes. it was a little bit late, but they did do that also. Correct. Yeah. Did you know if the University of Missouri now has a free speech policy? Well, they also passed a law very similar to what this is, Missouri did. Right. But it was after the fact. I mean, way after the fact. I would like to add for the record that the university did ask Senator Holleran and this committee to delay his hearing on this bill until they were able to come out with their policy. And I thought that we all thought, Senator Halloran agreed that that would, that would be good uh, to have both sides of the issue here as we debated, and I think that helped the committee. So thank you, Senator Halloran and the University of Nebraska. That ends the hearing. Unless somebody else has a question. Okay, Mike.